Hi everybody, welcome to FNS Wrestling Podcast, episode 89. I almost blanked on the name of our podcast after 89 weeks. That is impressive. I mean, that's that's pretty good considering that's you didn't forget already. Professional podcast yeah. right there. Well, at least you didn't forget already, I think. I mean, that's I don't know. <laughs> right. Uh, so we're back in the basement to talk about some wrestling on the biggest week of wrestling ever, probably. Which hasn't felt like it. Not yet, so we're recording this as Stand and Deliver is just starting right now, right? Um, And we had Supercard of Honor last night, which I just watched the opener of. I haven't watched anything else, but we've got WrestleMania Night 1 coming tonight, obviously Night 2 tomorrow night, and then I don't know whatever else is going on. I imagine every federation is probably... The only Raw that we ever have to watch. Are we going to watch it, actually? Wow. It's Raw after Mania. I know, but I guess I'll give it a try. I don't care about Mania at all. so the Law. I can't imagine I'll care about the... Yeah, but they usually do something, except for the one year they didn't, which was either last year, I think it was last year that they did nothing. Right. For Raw after Mania. See, so. Sounds about right. Like, they do nothing lately, so that would make sense. It's very on-brand, do nothing. And the one before that was Empty Arena. And then the one before that in 2019 was the Viking Experience. Oh, amazing. <laughs> but So yeah, we're back down here to talk about whatever we watch this week, and we'll do a um, a preview of WrestleMania, I think, right, with our predictions at the end. It'll be quick in the other, any other wrestling business section at the end. Yep. Um, what was exciting this week? You went out to two movies this week. Oh, yeah, I saw... One that you'd already seen and one that you hadn't. So yeah, your I thoughts saw without spoilers? Morbius, which is actually okay. It didn't suck, which is all we could have expected. But it still wasn't like a top-tier uh no it, it was just film. okay yeah um okay. and then saw batman second time if you haven't seen it then you it just it's been out for months so whatever yeah um but that it was still really good um the people i went with hadn't seen it so that was cool um but yeah that was still good nice and you had more badminton that you won again so you still have not lost in your yeah. sports debut so that's pretty cool uh, I found out today that two of my office mates have tested positive for COVID, so that's exciting. I don't know. It's just mm-hmm. it's just the way it is at this point right now, right? They feel both feel pretty okay. They've just and one of them tested negative seven times uh, before testing positive because he's been fighting a cold all week and sort of masking and staying away from us. Thankfully, um, I mean I'm not super worried being fully vaxxed and having COVID already, so I'm uh yeah as immune as i'm gonna get but um yeah so that's what's going on in my office not much exciting to discuss this week weather's mm-hmm. beautiful today took your brother over to watch some basketball at the school mm-hmm. he's got a couple practices this weekend that we have to go to. well you don't have to go to but i have I to go not. to as the coach right um but anyways yeah so just kind of springtime in southern ontario getting ready to put the snow shovels away for good i'm hoping that last snowfall was hopefully the last right. one that we get. Yeah, but, uh, that was kind of just like the random day in the week. Yeah. Right, random snowfall at the end of March, which is always yeah. appreciated. But anyways, I don't really have... You'd love to see it. I don't have much to banter about because I figure we've got a lot of stuff going on today because you said you have a pretty decent figuring it out, yeah, right? Yeah, they and... did reveals for Mania. I think at Access, which they did do. Oh, nice. So I say we, I don't know, we transition into talking about some wrestling unless you have something profound to share with our listeners I right now. I do not. You do not. Okay. Well, let's start talking about some of the week's wrestling news and rumors. <laughs> So taking a look at this week's ratings, Tuesday Stand and Deliver Go Home Edition of NXT 2.0 drew 626,000 viewers, which is almost the same as last week, up 0.31%, so less than a percent, earned a 0.14 in the key 18 to 49 demographic, which is exactly the same as last week. So basically, their numbers just held steady, and those numbers are within their normal range, right? Nothing spectacular, but a solid number for them. Wednesday's live edition of AEW Dynamite drew 979 viewers, down 6.4%, earned a 0.38 in the demo, which is down 7.31, so slightly down from last week, but nothing super drastic, still hovering around that 1 million viewer mark. And, you know what? I did a check-in with Impact Wrestling. Nice. I felt bad, because the last time I checked in, it was the all-time low. Right. Wasn't it like 68,000 viewers or something like that? <laughs> Terrible. Um, so this drew the second best audience of the year so i thought i'd report that to balance it out so any guesses if their lowest was 60 i think it was sixty eight thousand. this is their second best audience guess their total viewership One hundred twenty thousand. it's not far off One hundred forty nine thousand. 
which is up 49% from so the their previous year. their second week. best, like, ever? Or just, like, second on Second best this, this year. This year. Oh, this year, okay. But that's still a very good <laughs> rating for them. <laughs> and like second... Second best ever. That'd second be best funny. key demo rating. What would you guess that to be of uh, this year as well? It was, like, 0. 0.1 last week, I think, or something. Point one. Or, sorry, 0. 0.01. 0. 0.13. 0. 0.04. Nice. And that's up 100%. Um, so... That's good news for Impact. I personally have missed this week's show. I may go back and watch it, but it might, I might struggle because there's so much wrestling to watch this week, so I did not catch it. But nice to see that they, they drew a decent rating for them, not in general, but for Impact specifically. What do you have for us? Um, so Mad Cat Moss is going to superstardom because Told he you. won the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, so that's the... Uh seal of approval i know they i think they do have big plans for him not that this is really evidence because nobody has anybody that won this battle royal really gone on to anything uh, like directly after i mean like maybe eventually let's see um so cesaro no no he became a paul Heyman guy and then they dropped him immediately yep big show stayed doing big show things yep uh baron corbin he didn't really do much no nope. for until like 2017 which would have been like at least a year after right uh, 2017, Mojo Rawley. He never did anything. Look at him now. Um, 2018, Matt Hardy. Woken Matt Hardy. Uh, he won tag titles with Bray Wyatt. Totally forgot he won. Um, Braun Strowman, 2019. He didn't do much after that. And gone. Uh, there wasn't one 2020. And then Jey Uso won last year, and he went back to the tag division. Right. So it is not really um, a stepping stone to stu- superstardom by any means, but I think they do have plans for moss i think people like i don't think he's bad honestly like he obviously has the look they want he's huge and ripped and he's really really fast so i think he's gonna be he can work their main roster style he'll probably be i think he's a future star for them i could be wrong but we'll see uh what do i have for you taya valkyrie has returned to impact wrestling um so i guess I, again, I haven't seen it, but Peraza cut a promo on the new ROH interim women's world champion Mercedes Martinez. I do have some spoilers from Supercard of Honor in my news since it did happen yesterday. I'm still going to watch the show even though I know a lot of who won. But anyways, so Martinez won the interim title by defeating Willow on Supercard of Honor. And Taya Valkyrie made her return, interrupted the promo. So Valkyrie and Perazzo had words and basically... They will have a match for the AAA, what is it, Reina de Reina's title. That sounds right. And that is for the upcoming Impact Rebellion pay-per-view. So I like Taya Valkyrie, and I think you do too, but she did not look good in NXT, right? Like, even in ring. Not at all. She didn't look good in ring, even. Like, she looked like she'd lost a step to me. I don't know if you can blame working WWE style or what, but she did not look as good as she has in the past. So I hope that she returns to top form, because if she does, Valkyrie Perazzo is a match that I would really want to that see. That they already had. Right? That should be really good. But they probably have, but it should be a no, good match. No, like her last match or something. Or oh, was it? That makes sense. Would be, it should be a good match nonetheless. So I'm, I'm hoping that Valkyrie, uh, her returning to Impact makes sense, right? She's a, she's a good fit for that company, so I hope things go well for her. And she's Canadian, so we gotta love her. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Yeah, uh, Tony Storm debuted in AEW. She did, and we'll get to that. But yes, she Yay. has. She is all elite. She qualified for the Women's Own Heart tournament. She so did. That's cool. And I'll save my thoughts on the quality of the match and her debut when we get to it. But yes, she she did show up on this week's Dynamite to not, Jack's not Jack's the, new favorite. Not the worst signing they could have made, but also far from the best signing they could have made. <laughs> I, I don't know. I I think she'll she'll help the division. Right? She's a notable name. In theory, she is a good wrestler. We haven't seen it in a while. Her Again, her time, much like we were just saying about Valkyrie, right? She did not look good in NXT, and you no. really were not and, a fan. Well, and Tony Storm, like, I, I feel like most people should look in NXT. And to be fair, Monet, at least, like, or Valkyrie, like, it was also kind of half 2.0'd, it I was. feel was. Like, so. She got there right as it was starting to transition, For unfortunately for her as a veteran, because in 2.0, if you're a veteran, you're worthless uh, in that company. Right. Um, uh, also from Supercard of Honor, Wheeler Yuta defeated Josh Woods for the pure title, and he then was announced as All Elite. So even though Yuta's been there a while and wrestled a bunch of matches, I guess he wasn't technically signed. Yeah, they, they do that sometimes. Right, so I you would have just assumed he's signed because he's been on week after week after week, right? But I guess now it's official, 
And I think Yuta's the perfect type of wrestler to appear on the new ROH that's run by AEW. He's a talented guy, but like Dynamite's just too crowded for him right now, and he has a history with Ring of Honor, so that makes sense. Well, I mean, like at least Yuta's getting in with the Blackpool. Right, it seems like club. he is, right? So, because yeah. um, Regal was at Supercard of Honor as well, right? I think watching the match or something. So, it makes sense because I don't think Woods is signed with AEW. So, it makes sense that they would take the title off of him and put it on somebody that does work for AEW. So, uh, I'm interested to see where they go. And Yuta is a good fit for that title. He can work that style. So, I, I think that's a decent move to make. Um. Yeah. And so they. I think so. I think it was because it got leaked last year, so they did like a little a YouTube video with Dude Perfect of all people to do a stage reveal for Mania. So oh, really, Dude yeah. Perfect got involved yeah. in that. So takes me back. I do have an image here, so I can do a description of this entrance stage because this is my thing, right? Okay. You do so, like entrance stage. So there's like a really long ramp, like WrestleMania 33. And it's like a really long LED ramp. It's got like WrestleMania vertically written. Nice. Uh, and then, so you got like a, a black platform, right? It's like kind of like, yeah. And then, <laughs> and then there's like this like LED wall with like, it's kind of got like a city design looking, right? And then like in the middle, there's just like a giant star. And then there's like a giant WrestleMania in there. And does it look good? I think it's good. It's like, it's Dallas, right? So there's like a lot of the stars and there's of other course. star stuff in the arena, but just solely on the entrance stage, I think, it, I think it works. I remember like the, Last time they were at this exact venue was 32, which was my first Mania. I remember, like, they had, like, this flat kind of looking stage, and, like, LED was kind of like a corner. Mm-hmm. And then, like, there was, like, a star-shaped LED ramp. So, yeah, um, I think it looks good. I think I like when they do, like, the location-specific ones. Like, right. they did, like, the giant pirate ship thing last time, and, like, right. um, for 34, they was did, that like, WrestleMania a... WrestleMania play button or WrestleMania... Play button was 31. <laughs> yeah. Um, And then, like... Uh, thirty three was like they did like they had like the roller coasters in the background and right. like the middle was like kind of like shaped like a sun your memory like, is Orlando ridiculous. and like thirty four was like a New Orleans kind of looked like you know like the party like you know New Orleans like yes, that kind of stuff Mardi Gras and then uh thirty five was lame because it was just like you know how they use like the big flat stage now for like every show that's yes. not Mania it was kind of like that for Mania so it was like a that was like the only time I remember like it being like kind of like not very interesting and then uh thirty six was pandemic. Right. Performance center. Whoop, whoop. Amazing. You, your attention to detail and memory is impressive because I yeah. would not remember any of that. Mm-hmm. Um, another surprise from Supercard of Honor. Brian Cage made an appearance. Oh, I just saw a picture of his hair. Like it look, he looks like Lucha Underground Cage. Oh, really? Yeah, his hair looks like it's like shaved hair. It's kind of like a mohawk or like oh, cool. not like I don't know. It it does look more Lucha Underground Cage to me. Um, and he is now aligned with Tully Blanchard, who has been sort of released by FTR recently, right? So, I don't know. Cage is another performer I think could flourish in the ROH version, the AEW version of ROH, again. Right, it benefits a lot of people, right? Because there's no room for him in AEW right now. And partnering him up with someone to speak for him is always a good idea, Did right? Did you see Cage what is... happened to Suzuki? No. Uh, Suzuki's TV champ now. Oh, cool. Yeah, beat Rhett Titus. Cause, oh, right, I knew they were facing each yeah. other. As good as Cage is in the ring, right? He should never be allowed to speak, unfortunately. Not to sound mean, but he's, yeah, bad. Like, he's I don't, really bad. I don't know why he wasn't in Team Taz, because now they've deprived me of Keith Lee versus Brian Cage, which is like, they both do standing moonsaults, so that, that's... as very large men. Yeah, and Luchasaurus. So that's the three-way match we need. Right. Anything else from you? I've got two um, more after this. So I saw this kind of as it was happening, so like... Spoilers for standing delivery, even though this is just a kickoff, so it's not really much, I think. Right. Um, but uh, Dakota Kai and Raquel Gonzalez won the women's tag titles from Toxic Attraction on the pre-show. So because they quickly cool. threw that match together on NXT this yeah, week, I'll get to it. It's just kind of like I'll talk about it then, but I really feel like they missed telling a story. It was just like they're back together now. Yeah. Gonzalez comes out to help Kai, and, and they hug, and they're. And Kai's not psychotic like, now. Right. Suddenly she, or she like, went or from whatever it was. multiple personality disorder kind of thing to not like liking Wendy of... Chu at all to becoming best friends with Wendy Chu to suddenly reuniting with Gonzalez with no real story to explain any of those points. Right. So they're just going to ignore Cora Jade and right. Wendy Chu. So Seems that's like. kind of 
So, yeah, yeah, it's weird. An interesting um, choice. I don't. Also, speaking of entrance stages, I clicked on the pre-show solely to see the entrance stage. Yes, I did that. And um, and I I was telling you like it's the exact same entrance stage they used for like Raw and SmackDown now. Like it's like laziness. Which is like I guess it's like because NXT is NXT, right? Like you it know is, how it looks. In fact, NXT. And but like it's just like that small aesthetic. So like it did look cool, like just from like the pictures I've seen, because it's just bigger it just looks nicer um but the stage is nothing nothing impressive like it looks different for the nxt people but stupid (laughs) also from the world of wwe reportedly there are plans for a major new heel faction on the raw brand and the pitch was made that would have hall of famer edge leading a heel stable um fightful select reporting that unless plans change that stable should begin to form imminently so maybe on the Post WrestleMania, maybe during. Oh, maybe Mania. that's one of the surprises. You go Edge Priest Miscellaneous. Yes, and Priest has been one of the names mentioned as a possible member. Which I also think he could use somebody to cut promos for him. I don't think he's quite as bad as Brian Cage, but I don't think Priest is great on I the think mic. Priest is okay. He's passable, yes. Yeah, but um, I mean, I don't really care too much about anything on Raw. But I thought that was a notable thing to talk about. And I only have one more story, so whatever you've got, I go have ahead. nothing. Nothing. The only other thing is minor, just because I like him. Ace Austin has signed a new contract with Impact Wrestling. Specific terms not released, but at least in my opinion, he is a good fit for Impact as well. Really talented guy in the ring. He's improved on the mic. I quite enjoy him. But I think he would be, if he went to WWE, he'd be misused, right? If he goes to AEW, kind of lost in the shuffle, unless they include him on the ROH brand. So I think that makes sense for him to stay in Impact. And I hope that they start to push him not just as an X Division guy. I think he could be in the title picture at some point, in my yeah. opinion. And he and Fulton are actually a pretty good act. Like, Fulton as his big man muscle is, it works for me. So, right. good for him. Mm-hmm. All right, that's going to wrap up our news and rumors, I guess. And we'll move into talking about this week's episode of AEW Dynamite. And so we open with CM Punk taking on Max Caster. We sure do. And he did a rap. He did? I will never, ever recap because no. it's impossible. And what he referenced? Something about the z Packs. Oh, anything. yeah, with Punk's issues with the medical team from WWE, which was part also of his... Also, Timely Curse Rock. His thingy, major... I yes, I think there was some of that as well. So, I, I mean, I still really enjoy their entrance. I saw a thing John Cena basically said that Caster's amazing, too. He said, like... He's doing what Cena used to do, but as a modern spin and better kind of thing, I think is what he said, which I right. think is cool that he yeah. acknowledged like, because people are like, oh, he's just ripping off Cena. Well, I mean, that was what, 20 years ago or something? Like, give the guy a break. I, he probably wasn't the first person to come out doing it either. So anyways, I, I still enjoy yeah. the acclaimed entrance. For sure. Um, yeah, it was a solid opener. Um, some notables. There was some casters working Punk's left arm in a hole, and then Punk gets him off and shoulder tackle for a one count, which I always think is stupid. Like shoulder tackle? Are you pinning him off a shoulder tackle? You never know. Like it's just You're taking away his stamina by making him kick out, okay? Right. <laughs> um there's a hammer thrown to the corner by Caster and he does it again, but the second time Punk flips over and falls to the dive and clothesline from the top and a snap suplex. Uh there's a fisherman buster by Caster for two. Uh there's a Frankenstein and then a corner knee bulldog by Punk. And the finish comes when he hits a pile driver and then he like rolls over and into the anaconda vice to tap Caster out, and then Shivani comes down to do a quick interview. Um, Punk says like, because Shivani is asking what the waist like, like he doesn't means. know, like gesturing, like know. yeah, like yeah. gesturing for the belt around his um, waist. Punk says he's asking what the champ to around the waist gesture means to the crowd after Shivani asked. Uh, he said he doesn't know who the champion will be in a week's time. Is there a title match next? <laughs> like, That's what I was wondering too, right? Like, why don't you know? I guess like it could possibly change any time i guess but like it's a 24 7 title yeah that's Someone, what i was gonna say someone's gonna roll him <laughs> up in the back somewhere yeah yeah or when he's like about to get on the plane or something right um he says he does know that there's gray in his beard that is true and by the time he's done in aw there will be a lot more and he has scars on his head he knows by the time he's done in aw he will have been world champion i don't think so i don't know i'm not i'm afraid he might be but uh, nah, so I think they're smarter than that. I thought this was a good TV match. Nothing special. Not really the hot opener that we get on Dynamite a lot of the time. I thought it was slow and steady. Good work from both guys. Caster did get a lot of offense in here. And then it was kind of Punk hitting his signature stuff and picking up the win. Um, I liked the match, but it felt like 
it never really got out of second gear you know what i mean like these guys have more that they could offer but yeah i, I felt like it never really like picked up i time. agree it just kind of held steady and it was it was a solid match i guess was what i would say um the aftermath tony talking to punk i'm fine with punk getting a title shot for sure but i don't really want him to win and i fear that he might at some point uh, i don't know if it's now or if they're gonna drag this out but I think he may get a title run at some point. I don't really want it. I just want him there to make other people look good at this point in his career. But I thought his intensity in the promo was nice, and at least it uh, makes his intentions clear, right? This is clearly he wants a shot at the title, so at least we know where he's going. It clarified things a bit. So, yeah, I was fine with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like it could be like he'll maybe challenge Hangman, but then lose. Um, yes, I'm saying Cole's going to lose again. Um, and then I feel like, because MJF will beat Hangman, then maybe, like, that's when you get the Punk MJF match. That's what match, I was thinking. They the wait until match. that. Yeah. And then I think MJF should win that, because then so he off the trilogy. Yes. I don't think Punk is going to win the title. I think there's I don't want him to. a chance, but I think AEW is, like, because he's older. Like, I feel like they could give him a mid-card title run or something, but, like, yeah. I don't think that, because, like, they, he planned out the first four champions since... Like I right. don't think Tony Khan would do something like that. It just doesn't seem like it's not like Dustin Rhodes is gonna. Like it's not the same. But you know what I mean. Yeah. Like I don't think they're gonna just do that. I feel like they're gonna give like their main title to the guys they want to make main guys. And I like the and role their Punk guys. is in the way they're using Punk right now. I I have no problem with right. it. Right. Like so. I feel like if Punk was gonna be world champion, it would have been in the slot that Chris Jericho was in in 2019. Obviously, yeah, that makes like, sense. Punk wasn't, but like he wasn't if there, he was but, yeah. there. I feel like that would have been like the spot you could have put. So you're starting out your company with a super recognizable person exactly, with but, the title to and, raise your profile. Right, sort of. exactly. Yeah. And their option was Jericho at the time. I feel like that could have been Punk should had the opportunity uh, arisen. But it just feels like there's a lot better options and a lot of like exactly. fresher faces, which I you think could they know put at the top. So yeah. and the and Punk's role's been like I'm not a big Punk fan, but yeah. I'm totally fine with the role yeah. he's been in. So mm -hmm. keep it rolling. Yeah, I thought it was solid. Nothing amazing or bad. Just. A fine medium length match that had some solid action, but nothing major. Like I said, it, it just didn't really feel like it ever never picked, picked up, up a ton. Yeah, I agree. Um, heating up Punk before I assume he's challenging for a title soon. Like whether it's successful or not, I feel like that we're definitely heading there regardless. Right. Um, Caster looked fine at times, but um, it just felt too slow sometimes. It would prefer a hotter opener, but it was solid. I'm not complaining a ton. Uh, post match promo was fine. Uh, pretty vague, but good. Does have a direction, which is. Something you can't say for some people. That's I right. Guess, so. Yep. Uh, next, you get an interview with MJFTR. Right. Mm -hmm. MJFTR. Indeed. Um, Sterling is hanging up security warnings with Wardlow on them. Yeah, all around. Well, hard camera, right? Ringside. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, MJ says the Pinnacle start getting wins this week after week. Um, without Wardlow on the way, because FTR will win tonight. Oh, well, in without Wardlow on the way. Hmm. And Spears will defeat Sean Dean next week, which is an easy W. Dax says they don't know what's going on between Max and Wardlow, but they don't want any part of it because MJ and Wardlow are both their friends. Mm -hmm. uh, MJ says there is family. He says Wardlow used to talk crap about them behind their backs. They do like a hands in the middle thing, and FTR is kind of unenthusiastic, and then MJ signs off the pinnacle catchphrase. Right. So I, I like this. Like FTR is caught in the middle here, right? And they know how MJF is, so they can't take everything he says literally because he is a weasel and mjf is doing his best to try and charm them and keep them on his side um but they're fdr rightfully suspicious right so all of this made sense i didn't think it took too much time so uh, it pushed this the story further along right um fdr looked like they're going babyface. mjf's going to be left with sort of a skeleton crew of the pinnacle left um so yeah it made sense to me i was fine with it yeah um i thought it was solid from mjf um like, FTR being neutral makes sense after last week, so at least, like, they're kind of continuing with the direction. I definitely see it going, like, MJF keeps escalating and becoming more of a dick, so then they eventually side with Wardlow, just based on the direction they've been right. going. Um, I like how MJF was acting fine with them not being involved, and then immediately threw an attempt to stir up the pot. Right? right. I thought that was pretty funny. Um, So, overall, solid segment. Uh, Next, we go think, to... Let me ask you a question. If MJF and Wardlow face off, who wins? It's tough, right? Can either because neither of them really look like they should be taking a loss right now. So yeah, but I was wondering. If... I feel like it. Wardlow should win because I feel like Hangman deserves a decent run. Right, and so right now I see it like he's still busy with Cole, which could last a bit. Right, and then they definitely seem to be heating up Punk. 
they do to challenge him right and so that's already two challengers which could last like Mm -hmm. at least like four months or something right and by that time i feel like you could have had mjf lose ward lows off building and then and you can heat mjf back up with the feud with someone like decent right and then when they need to they can heat him back up because i don't think mjf's like challenging pretty soon so i feel like he can kind of take the loss whereas i think wardlow's plans not like you can halt that for a bit. and i think you could have ftr sort of quote-unquote cost mjf the match as them sort of yeah their f- final act of defiance before leaving mjf right so that he has the excuse and i feel of, like spears can just be the yeah the henchman for mjf because there's clearly no plans for him to do anything other than that so yeah i guess that's where it could go and and we'll, i guess we'll see but yeah it, it's tough because they're both yeah super hot right now right and somebody's got to take a loss there so i think mjf is the one who can probably afford to take the loss more yeah and him complaining and ranting and raving after losing would be some interesting promos as well he would right. have excuses right that he could right. he could make for so sure. yeah that makes sense mm-hmm. uh next we're going to jay lethal versus john moxley for some reason i don't know but because it, it wrestling a, that's true because wrestling uh, it was pretty hard hitting. Um, it was. Notables, there was this, uh, some holds encounters early on, a strike exchange. Uh, there was a German super fine mox, and then the crowd count punches. He goes for a super flex and gets shoved off, and he kind of hits off the top rope. Right. Um, kind of lands odd. Uh, there's a big clothesline by Mox after a lethal count the first time. Uh, lethal combination for two. Mox counters a lethal injection but uh, into a sleeper, but lethal got out and hit a brain buster. And then uh, the finish comes when Mox kind of like outmaneuvers a clothesline, swings around, and hits a... Dirty Deeds, not a Paradigm Shift, because Paradigm Shift, you gotta lift him up. Yeah, he just, it was old school, yeah. yeah. Which he does sometimes, and, like, I remember the whole point, I was like, he did Dirty Deeds in Japan, he couldn't win, so then he brought out Paradigm Shift, or Death Rider, or Death whatever. Rider, mm-hmm. And, like, I don't, I feel like sometimes when he's just, like, doing it really fast, he doesn't, like, he just does, like, the quick snap down d- DDT, yes. like, like the Dirty Deeds he did here, so, that's fine, though. Uh, Mox wins. Uh, what'd you think? I enjoyed this match, it was... Mox kept it pretty simple. A ton. Uh, I know some people are probably going to say it was too many forearms and stuff. It was very much a lot of him with stiff strikes. And I think Lethal's like found this role as the guy who has really good matches against top talent, but doesn't really win or need to, I don't think. Um, Mox gets a quality win. I thought Lethal looked strong in defeat. I like the handshake afterwards, too, because... Mox is the guy that will like kill you in the ring, but shake your hand afterwards, right? So I kind of like that idea. He's not quite full heel, but he is a violent in-ring competitor who is respectful afterwards. So I kind of like that. I thought this was a good match. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I thought it was solid, hard-hitting, fair because it was Mox match, and no, this is Mox now. Um, I don't think there are any major spots or anything, but I think it was on solid. I liked it better than the opener. Me too. I wish like th- this was tied more to like the Blackpool Combat Club, like. It was some prospect, maybe, or, like, someone they even mentioned in passing. Like, I yeah. feel like Lethal is just kind of, like, a random one. But I think it, I was. Think it was good. It's just I wish it was kind of, like, because, like, Danielson's facing Yuta later. You yes. know what I mean? So I feel like I wish it was, like, something a little more tight. I think even da- if Mox is, like, facing Trent or something. I think Danielson's faced everybody that he mentioned, but I don't know if Mox has. Garcia. Remember, it was Garcia, Moriarty, and Yuta. He did. Do so this. I think Dan- what, Danielson's faced all of them, but Moxley could I think could Moriarty too. was before the. I want to say Moriarty was before Blackpool Combat Club. Like, I, I think, think it was, was. But he still did, yeah. Yeah. He still faced him. Yeah. I know. I know he did face him. Yeah. Right. Um. Next, we had a fast video package for play. Uh, Marina Shafir. So you have to understand, listeners. We will always refer to her. It's in both of our notes. We talked about it because we just thought it was funny on what NXT. That she Back and in the good old days. Jessamine Duke were fight and play. Yeah. So we will probably refer to she her as play because she was play and Jessamine Duke was yeah, fight. Yeah, they had like so. let's play, let's fight shirts yeah. and she was play. So. so it's play. If we yeah. hear us just say play, we mean Marina Shafir. Yeah, Marina Shafir. And I don't even know, I don't even remember the vignette. It was a super point. short uh, play package. But so. basically she's here. Play yeah. is here. She exists. She's been on dark. Right. So Send play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's nice. here. Um. I- it's I have, possible she's been undefeated for a year. So we don't know. I was never impressed with her at all, but obviously she's had tons. I think she's better than Duke, though. She's had tons of time to improve. She has a husband who could train her, right? And she has an MMA. Oh, back- well, then she must suck at promos. She has an MMA background. So, I mean, I, 
she was not impressive at all last I saw her, but that was years ago. So I'm really hoping no, that she was in the women's dusty cup last year. I'm really hoping she's improved a ton, but we'll see. And without fight by her side, I don't know what she's going to do. I think she teamed with, um, Zoe Stark. Oh, really? Yeah. It was before like they started actually like doing stuff. Do not remember. Or Zoe Stark. Um, because I remember, uh, I remember Gigi Dolan, I think Cora Jade teamed in the, the dusty cup. Cause remember right. that was when they signed, uh, Dolan Jade and um Zoe Stark because remember yes. they're all like indie people yes they were and so I remember one of them teamed with Shafir and then the other two teamed and I know I'm pretty sure it was Zoe Stark teaming with Shafir and then Stark they, can play they <laughs> <laughs> nice it works nice and then they they lost in the first round and I think like the week after or a couple weeks after that's when like Stark started getting I no I think it was the week after because remember then she started doing like the the squash matches yes. for a bit yeah that was after that so that was the last time Shafir probably wrestled on nxt yeah i think she's been doing indie stuff but i'm not sure so here's hoping she's and gotten dark. better well she's been on dark okay do not disrespect dark how True. dare you uh, next we get ftr versus the ass boys <laughs> of gun club mm-hmm. uh mjf on commentary this is fine uh there's a drop to hold by austin gun he walks over to axe arm drags and a drop kick by cash there's some fast tag work by ftr and then they got a one count so it was like pretty fast actually for ftr yeah, I have smooth, simple, effective teamwork by mm-hmm. FTR. Um, Austin just shocks the from Billy Gunn, takes a cheap shot to cash, then Austin attacks afterwards, because you gotta have Billy Gunn in. You, you do. Got, you gotta. He's the star of that faction. Some would say, yes. and they would be right. I think they're right. Mm-hmm. Um, after a couple of counters, Dax nails, Dax nails a short arm lariat for two. Uh, we cut to backstage where Wardler's on the way, taking security as he goes. And then as he's making his way through the crowd, then a swarm of guards to get him and take him away. FTR kind of get distracted, but they are still able to cut off an interference from Billy Gunn and win with the smash contraption. It's true. And they kind of argue with MJF after. I thought the um, the Gun Boys really dialed up the obnoxiousness to start this match. Not in a bad way. They're trying to be heels, right? So they were super over the top to start. I thought it was kind of a slow start, and then um, Cash gets in, hits his flurry, and things kind of picked up. I really like the double teamwork by FTR. It's all really kind of simple but effective and quick, right? Which makes sense for their style. They're trying to efficiently beat you without really taking a lot of risks, so it made a lot of sense. Um, then we got a nice Dax hot tag, right, with a lot of stiff strikes. Um, I thought Dax was great after the match, yelling at MJF about... Um, Basically, your stuff with Wardlow is now affecting our stuff, right? So he has a problem with right. that. I really like that. I thought yeah, for sure. that was cool. Um, the match itself was, I, surprise, surprise, I'm going to say it, fine. FTR mm-hmm. got a win. I like um, that like they did do, they are continuing the Wardlow thing. I was like, oh, they're doing the payoff already. But like MJF had it ready, right? That's so right. I think it's cool. And um, I'm, I think Wardlow's kind of an idiot. He must have not seen the posters. Like, <laughs> he came down anyways, disobeyed yeah. those he disobeyed 15 posters. He disobeyed those very clear posters. You can't disobey posters. If it's posted on the wall, yep. you yep. better listen to it. I'm not sure about the pause, the lengthy pause, kind of when Wardlow came down. Yeah, I, I thought... wasn't a huge fan of that, but I don't mind it because it did further the storyline. Like, I feel like it at least kind of worked. But whichever of the guns was on the mat looks kind of foolish because they just kind of stayed there for a long time, right? That's yeah. the, not that uh... I care about. The gun club <laughs> yeah, that's much, what I was gonna but... say. At least it's gun club, right? Um, it, more. I think this was one of those like less about the match and more about the yeah. aftermath of forwarding Wardlow, MJF, and FTR Pinnacle story. So it was fine for that in that sense. The match itself wasn't anything special. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna agree. It was fine. It wasn't terrible, but I don't think Gun Club are very good. And Babyface FTR is just not the best of FTR. Um, I don't think we need the Billy Gun intervention because he sucks and he's old. Um, I think Wardlow thing to distract from the match, which sucks, but I think it also served that storyline, which is kind of what this mainly felt for, so yes. that's okay. Um, caused more tension in the in the pinnacle, so that was cool, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, next, we got a quick team Taz promo. Um, Hobbs and Lee exchange words. Hobbs told Lee that he will beat Lee on Rampage this Friday, and it's their show, and Lee told Hobbs to bask in his glory. Yeah, um, I thought... I actually quite like this. Keith Lee finally got a chance to speak without being interrupted. I thought Hobbs sounded pretty cool here and showcased some personality because normally he's just kind of the muscle standing behind Starks, right? So I thought this short segment accomplished quite a bit, uh, and I liked it. I thought, yeah, I was really impressed with Hobbs here. He showcased some personality. He had one line that made me laugh. I forget what it was. You're going to bask in something. I forget what he said, but it doesn't matter. I liked it. You? Um, yeah, I thought it was fine. 
Um, <laughs> Hobbs spoke fine. Lee was all right. Should be a solid match, but it's on Rampage. I just don't care that much. Rampage just isn't super important, and the time slot doesn't do it any favors. We've said it before, and I'll say Every it Every time I watch it, I really enjoy it, though. I never watch it in a timely fashion. It's always like Monday or Tuesday or something when there's no other wrestling that interests me. Um, I'll sort of watch it, and it's always a good show, and it goes by really quickly. It's just, yeah, that Friday night time slot and being the night before we record this show it doesn't really work. It starts at but... 10. Like, if it started at 9 and it Is it not backed 10? up yet? I thought it was moving back to, like, was 8 like o'clock. was, like, a bit. Oh, okay. It was, like Wasn't a special a start day? time. Oh. Yeah, so it's always been a good show. I just don't get around to it until it's a few days old. But anyways, carry right. on. Yeah, same. Uh, next, we get a Jazz promo. Same spot as last time. Mm-hmm. Um, Chris Jericho standing by uh, with them, um, saying that they are revolutionary force in sports entertainment. Uh, Jericho claimed that everybody wants to be part of the group, like Dirt Sheet Riders fans and Lily Wrestlers. They want to be part of Jazz, but it's only the five of them. Daniel Garcia said that the future endeavored Silver and Reynolds while taking out Kings and Santana Ortiz. They do the thing where they look around for them again, but when they looked on one side, oh my god, they are there. And then they attack. Um, Kingston was biting Jericho's face at one point. Kingston hit uh, the Hurricane, the yeah. swing back fist to Jericho at one point. Uh, Kingston got a hold of Garcia. He got, uh, took a kick from Santana. Sent, uh, Ortiz sent Matt Menard into the steel steps. Uh, Kingston sent Garcia into a chair on the floor. Santana went up top. Parker threw him down. Hager tossed Ortiz in the turnbuckle. Hager hit his, like, slammy doohickey on Kingston. Slammy doohickey. Yep. Uh, Menard sent Ortiz in steel steps, so uh, payback. Uh, Parker and Hager hit, like, a version of a street sweeper, which is disrespectful. <laughs> and King uh, Jericho beat on Kingston with the baseball bat while he was in a sharpshooter. Jericho took out his belt and hit Kingston with that. And it had a juice effect to Kingston, and that was it. Didn't feel long at all. No, it was a uh, very Short. lengthy brawl beat down whatever i'm not sure how i feel about jas still um i thought jericho stumbled a little bit when he was speaking but then he quickly kind of handed it off to the other members so i find 2.0 entertaining especially matt it makes me laugh um garcia is getting mic time and doing a pretty good job i think so i think i'm okay with the group but like i was telling you it's despite their gimmick you know what i mean not because of it i don't like them because of this whole sports entertainer gimmick I like them because 2.0 and Garcia are interesting to me right now. Um, and didn't you think it was strange that even though JAS is the sports entertainment faction, I felt like Santana and Ortiz and Kingston patiently waiting behind the curtain was very sports entertainment. Yeah. Right? Because what we know about those guys is they're just going to come out and attack you and fight you, right? Which would fit more with their character to me. But standing behind the curtain. Because they're sports entertainment, I guess, like the other guys. And knowing that they're going to pull the curtain back felt very, very sports entertainment to me. So I thought that was a bit strange. The brawl was fine, but way too long, right? Like, I would have cut some minutes off of that and added it somewhere else. It just seemed to go on and on and on and on. And they have so many of these outside of match context brawls in AEW that they're kind of meaningless to me at this point. Um, It takes something a little special to impressed me so it was fine but i'm i'm not a huge fan of the gimmick but i'm kind of enjoying parts of the group i guess if that makes sense yeah um yeah i was okay the promo was standing the power of the turf powerful mocked them actually appearing was something could have seen coming but it was still fine a uh, whole brawl is fine definitely overstay its welcome like yes, way too long sure. i think jazz is fine like you said i don't like the gimmick but the talent are working with what they can i think two point are still funny definitely puts a better spotlight on them and garcia but and I guess Jericho's problem again. I don't care about Hager. I think they need a better gimmick though, because then I think that would do them even more favors. Like I think I, th- it does like give them a spot, but I feel like this is just kind of crummy. And I feel like they're telling us they're sports entertainers, but they're not doing much to show us, right? right. Like again, Jericho's promo should feel scripted and awkward and like not like human beings speak. And they should be slowing down and wrestling a safer style, like if they really want to lean into it. So it feels like they're just saying they're sports entertainers and not other than like obviously changing 2.0's names and making them ridiculous and and some of yeah i think maybe even garcia's gear he was wearing tonight is supposed to typical street gear (laughs) right so i i don't know i feel like they're they're telling us they're sports entertainers but they're not fully committed to the gimmick at this point so i'm a bit disconnected i'm assuming we eventually get to a 10-man tag maybe at the pay-per-view and then i was that way and i was like oh this is stadium stampede season that would be my guess as well yeah 
Yep. It's like war games. Yep. Except you always no. got to have Chris Jericho in this one. That, so far, it seems that way, yes. Last year, year before that, this one. It's just not in your circle. But, I mean, everyone except Guevara would be involved. Unless Guevara gets involved, but he's fighting an old guy who's wearing a TNT belt. <laughs> so I guess so. Yeah. And making sexual jokes about said belt. Yep. He did that indeed. He did do that. They did do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, next we had Jake Cargo promo. Sterling says they have decided Cargo's 30th win opponent. And they had two options, which I'll get to that. Uh, and he went with the most prestigious, uh, Leva Bates. The uh, librarian? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cargo asks if this is a joke and tells Leva to go. Sterling says they can go to the other option, which is play. Right. So it's going to be play. Uh-huh. Um, Cargo says she will take care of her body section. So then can take care of the match stuff or something, whatever they said. Yeah, I like Jade here. She said more and different things from the cookie cutter she segments. She said more and different things. Well, I mean, that's been our thing, right? Um, yeah. And her seeming to have a little bit of an issue with Sterling here is also new. So basically, it felt like they took a step forward from the usual segments, which we've always said are fine but they're almost always the same every week. So this was a little bit different. Jade said more. She didn't say the same thing, like who's next or who's left. Um, and she had some st- maybe some issues with Sterling. So it kind of went into new territory, which I appreciated because it's been very, very similar for many, many weeks, right? Yeah. Um, it was fine. <laughs> um, I can't say I'm excited to see Cargill and Shafir play with each other, um, but I guess it's better than Leva Bates. I don't think Cargill play will be a good match, no. No. But um, I would like to question why there are two, only two options for a 30th win are Marina Shafir mm-hmm. and Leva Bates. That's it. Those are your options. <laughs> Nobody else. Like, that's just fine. Ruby Soho? No. Like, she's gone. Yeah. She's like, disappeared. Or, I don't know. Like, Brandy Rhodes. The TBS division does not seem super stacked. And then, whatever that she is. Be Anna Jay. At this point. Uh, hold on, I got it. Um, a Penelope Ford. I don't know. Like she's been gone a while too. It seems. Uh, Bunny. Bunny. Or like I heard they want Ember Moon. Do that. Do yeah, that. That'd be cool. She'd lose, but do that. I mean, yeah. Soho lost too. After she won the battle. So Royal. not a prestigious belt when your only two options are someone who's never wrestled on television for AEW. And leave a base. And someone who hasn't wrestled or been anything beyond a comedy jobber in her time. So that's what you're saying the top contenders for this for championship. For her 30th win, too. And it doesn't make this championship look very important. It does not. No. Also, where has she and Dee been? What happened to that? Yes. Where know. is that? I don't, I don't want to see Tony Storm. Remember, we only have that. time for one women's match on this two-hour show. But we can have Jericho brawl for 20 minutes after a promo. So... That seems yeah. to be where we're at, unfortunately. Yeah, that kind of sucks. I, didn't, I think that's like one of the only like major detractors from EW. It's like they're just not working the women's division. They great. seem to not quite know what to do with it, right? I don't know. Maybe it needs more time on ROH or somewhere. I feel like even then, like even then, I feel like I think they need the spotlight on Dynamite. Like, I feel like they need more there. Like even a first hour and a second hour match, right, or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Anyways. I think that's like. Because I don't think it's ever going to be like more like no. or like equal completely. But no, I think it won't. that's like, and they get a decent amount of segments. But I don't think segments like all these short segments that are just okay and then a meh match every week. I don't think that's really well, doing and, them any wonders. And it seems to be that time slot of it's at the near the beginning of the second hour and it's going to be a medium length match and there's going to be a commercial break. Right, yeah. Which is poorly yeah. planned as well, it feels like. Which it will be. But we say it all the time. There's no, yeah. nothing new if you listen to us. Mm-hmm. Same complaint. Um, Shafir better have improved. I hope um, so. I'm excited for that play date. Nah. Uh-huh. Um, next we get Brian DeAnson versus future Ring of Honor pure wrestling champion. Wheeler Yuta. Wheeler Yuta. That's right. The Kadoder. Right? The decoder. No. Yes. Um, so there's some holes and counters early on. There's like an interesting figure four, like submission by Yuta, where he's like just bridging on his head. So mm-hmm. that was kind of interesting. Uh, but Brian grabs the rope, <laughs> corner chops and kicks by Brian, uh, repeated elbows on the jaw by Brian. Um, but Yuta counter, he slips out a cattle mutilation out as it's about to be hit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, hits elbows of his own, like same manner and then gets a roll up pin for two trapping arms. Brian nails the psycho knee. 
Yuta spits at Brian, so he stomps the crap out of Yuta's he face. Sure does. It's a gotch pile driver, then locks in like a cross face for the win, so just kills Yuta. Um, yeah, this match already highly enjoyable, and then I thought it picked up to another level. Like we were talking about, the opener didn't, right? I felt like when Yuta, Yuta countered the cattle mutilation, the crowd got super behind him, and then he got in a little flurry there, and it kind of picked up the, took this to yeah, the next sure. level. Um, another really strong match for Danielson. I'm a sucker for everything he does at this point. He looks like he's actually fighting somebody, right? Which I think is the point of wrestling. He makes it easy to suspend your disbelief. Like, we know this is all not real or choreographed or however you want to say it, but it's easy to forget that when you're watching a Brian Danielson match, right? Which I really appreciate and love. Um, he's the best right now, I think, and I really enjoyed this match. And, yeah, I thought... The crowd really got behind Yuta there, and him countering the cattle mutilation is like a feather in his cap, I think, right? Because that's a fairly protected move. So I, I really like this match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot, too. I think it was by far the best Yuta's looked in AEW so far. Um, the technical counters were really nice. I like that cattle mutilation counter. Like, he had it scouted. Um, I saw it again, and I thought it was, like, really cool. He just, like, slipped out like that. It was cool. Um, Yuta also got violent with Anderson, which I like because he should be embracing that now. And his defiant, like, spitting in his face, too. Right. Even though it triggered Brit Br Danielson I to feel just like murder him. Know that, too. that was cool, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, it was definitely a step in the right direction for you. Uh, he should be like this. And then he could be in um, exactly. Blackpool Combat Club. Right. And Brian killed him at the end. Like, he just, did. <laughs> he stomped the crap out of him and then felt the need to still drop him on his head. And which see, I thought was pretty funny. WWE, you can have a smaller wrestler. Daniel Bryan is not a large man by any means, and he looks like an absolute killer, right? It's yeah. all how you present him. I'd like Bryan Danielson it versus Brock Lesnar. It doesn't matter how big he is. They had a match, but I'd like Bryan Danielson versus Brock Lesnar instead yes, of Daniel version. Bryan. Yes. Like, that would just, he would just. They would, he would just kick the crap out of Lesnar's face, and he would probably take it too, because like. Yep. Oh Lesnar. yeah, he would let him. They yeah. would have an agreement. That sure. that would be that would be cool. Yep. Um. Next we had a Jarby on Dry package. Didn't catch much of it. It was just like kind of highlighting this kind of feud so far, and then there's gonna be a match. Yeah, it was basically. I wonder if it's gonna be good. It was basically Alan saying like he's faced all of the henchmen, and now he's ready for the final boss. Essentially, is it was I thought it was good. Like it was. I a, bet the match is gonna suck. A quick little back and forth, and I, I'm already looking forward to the match. And this just added a little bit to it. I I liked it. Um, there yeah, there, it was quick, but I thought it was good. Yeah, I, it was good. Yeah. It was pretty quick, solid, straightforward. I liked the back and forth style again. Looking forward to the match. Um, Darby hasn't done body paint in a while. He should do some body paint. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Uh, last time he did it was probably the pay per view. So he should do that again. Sure. Um. Yeah. Um. He's listening. I would assume. Yeah. Hi, Darby His Allen. His face paint looks pretty like normal this week. So like, do a better one. You he's know? one of our followers. I would yeah. assume. He should do a better one. Yep. Uh. Next we get the undisputed elite your quotes title celebration. Mm -hmm. Uh. So Cole says Hangman Jurassic Express are not here because they weren't invited and are ashamed they took the titles from them so easily. He says. People are saying they stole them, but they didn't steal them. Even though they've taped over and put their own names on it, which is kind of funny. <laughs> I thought that was pretty like, funny. Not even like trying hard to make it look good, just like white athletic tape with black marker with their yeah, name, which is funny. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Yeah, that was funny. Because um, you can't steal something that belongs to you, and this celebration is for everyone. And it's a new era with new guys leading the show, and they're the three best pro wrestlers in the world. Kyle is saying something, but it's like he's drunk what or something. What happened there? I guess he was like trying to mimic he's like, drunk or something. I like, thought he almost maybe did get actually lost in his own promo and then decided to just sit down. Like I, I, I think it was just he was trying to like act like he's drunk, but it was I just get that really he was weird. saying they celebrated too much before coming out, but uh, he's not a good enough actor to pull. It, this it was off. really weird for yeah, sure. It was. Um, and then Fish kind of picks up the slack. He says Red Dragon's reputation precedes them. You're looking at the best AEW has to offer, bar none. Cole says the celebration will go best tonight, and he gets cut up by Hangman's music. Hits, he arrives in a white car with hood horns. No, not JBL's car. It was not a limo. No. Um, Hangman attacks. Um, I can still call them UE. I won't because I hate it, but um, I, you technically <laughs> you could. still can. Yeah. And I, he, the they can do the head gesture now. Yeah. They didn't do it this time, but they can do it. Maybe that's WWE intellectual property. Maybe they can't. Yeah, but can, you, can you IP a <laughs> hand maybe, gesture? Maybe the Maybe they'll do it, and then it'll be like a Bullet Club thing with the cease and desist. Remember that? Yes. Too sweet. Yes. It'll, be, it'll be like that. 
Um, he attacks them, he takes them all up, a red dragon save cool from a buckshot. They get sent back into the ring by Jurassic Express and Uncle Christian. Um, Christian Cage versus Cole next week. Wow, really? Uh, Jurassic Express beats them down and send them packing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I... I don't know. I thought Adam Page looked pretty badass when he came out there and, and cleared house. But now that I think Christian really feel like he's kind of just there, right? Because now Hangman is affiliated with Jurassic Express and Christian still comes out with them, but doesn't really have any purpose, doesn't really talk anymore, doesn't really wrestle anymore. So I don't love the, the often used like stealing of the belts angle, but it didn't last long. At least the belts are back where they belong, I guess. So I guess it was a fine angle, but or a fine segment to further this angle. But again, it's another like lots of people brawling, right? We already had that to excess with JAS, and now we have it again here. So it seems to be like the well that AEW keeps going back to a lot. Um, it's better than them having interference in all the matches and things, I guess. But it gets a little bit tedious for me with the constant people brawling outside of matches in AEW. But anyways, I say that all the time. What did you think of this? Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was all right. I think Cole was solid until promo. Then Kyle was kind of weird, and Fish was fine. Not their best promo, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Brawl is typical. not bad. I assume we'll get both of these title matches at Double Nothing, which is next month. I don't think they'd do a TV special beforehand. Right. Um, the prophecy. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, Shivani interviews Sandra Rose on the stage. She talks about like being the first Mexican women's champion or something, which I don't know if that's like AEW or... I feel like that was, A, she's probably proud of it, and B, um, AEW takes flack for their lack of diversity at the top, so this is them kind of like, by the way, Mexican champion, right, right here. More, more diversity in the women's division. And you have a black they, champion and a, and a Mexican champion. They have other diversity. There's a dinosaur champion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. Well, and Nyla uh, Rose oh, was a Scorpio champion. Sky. Nyla He's Rose was a champion, right? So, That's true. Yeah. Um, she does. Yep. Uh, anyways, uh, she says she doesn't just want to be the face of the division. She wants to be the face of women's wrestling. So they shouldn't make her champion. She doesn't want to be the face of the division. So they should get rid of her as champion then. She doesn't want to do it. No. Um, she says bullies always try to knock her down and pillars get knocked down. But foundation doors remain. She'll be a foundation. Uh, she talks to Nyland. She isn't going to lose the title at the first challenge. She wants to fight the best. Looking in the wrong place. And she has to defend. She will be there. Yeah, I was glad to see her talk and not get interrupted, finally. Um, I thought she did a good job here. She's like the super babyface fighting champion, which is a nice contrast to Britt Baker's like mega heel run, right? It's just, I don't know who your challenger are like you're heating up Nyla Rose but we talked about she's like the Lance Archer right like oh we need somebody we need our champion to get a quote-unquote quality win on their way to whatever right. their next big feud is but I don't know who the big feud like is. Like a solid not believable challenger. Like who's the next um heel woman to be ready for this like I would say Deeb but she's still tangled up with Sheeta. Which, so, <laughs> is that even going to end? So because what, now I'm not sure. So, like, who do you heat up to be a legit challenger for Thunder Rosa? I'm not sure who that is right now. Because uh, Tony Storm doesn't feel heel at this point. Well, and she sucks. Right? So it's got to be... I don't know who... Well, she's be. actually also in the tournament, though, so that's kind of going to yeah. have her wrapped up. Right. Uh, so I don't know what they're going to do, but I like Thunder Rosa as the champion, but outside of Britt Baker, I'm really not sure who's a believable challenger, but I guess they have time to figure that out. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where the sheet of things going, but I trust them. Um, I thought this was fine. At least she got to speak this time. Yeah, she did a good job. Not the best, but not bad. Solid promo, just kind of short. Herb's Nile again. Could be solid, at least I just don't really care. I don't think it'll be a bad match. I just don't care about Yeah, Nyla I usually Rose. like Nyla matches, she's, but it's not like she's going to win, right? She just so. doesn't interest me. Right. I find um, Vicky's a minus for her, too. But we'll get to that. It's yeah, coming up anyways. I, at least it makes her more vicious. <laughs> That's true. And vix, vixen. Vixen, uh, vixenosity? Vixenosis? Vixenice. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, next again, FTR promo. Um, Cash says, people like the ass boys think they take themselves too seriously. and Maybe they do. But this is all they care about. And they are the AAA Tag Team Champions. And on the Friday, they'll win the Irish Tag Team titles. They did. And they will become two a two-time AEW Tag Team Champions. I don't know. Um, Dax says he'll issue the challenge, and he challenges the Bucks to next week. Young Bucks FTR, too. Um, 
I like this promo. I think both of them so cool. I, I'm excited for the match next week, and it's for the AAA and Ring of Honor title, so yep. double title match FTR defending. Yeah, I thought this was a good little segment to like establish these guys as like your hardworking baby faces who are, like we've always said on this show, right? Like FTR seem to have good matches but never really win, and I think their characters are tired of that, and I'm kind of okay with them taking that, right? Like they want to be the face of the division. They don't want to just be like, supporting other teams and making other people look good sort of thing and honestly if it leads to another ftr young bucks match i'm fine with that right like i'm not tired of seeing that at all yet so i'm totally fine with this i thought it was a good little segment too yeah um that match should be good speaking of good just kidding (laughs) um we get to the bunny versus tony storm really good reaction for tony storm that really seemed to overwhelm her a bit right she was basically fighting back tears in her entrance and after the match. So yeah. clearly she was taken aback by the reaction. She got a good reaction for sure. She Yeah, that's people know who she is, so I'm sad about that. Um and this is a qualifier for the women's own heart tournament. It so is. Which they, they don't mention a lot about, I find. Like I, don't I keep going, why Oh yeah, a... it's the Owen Hart thing exists. I don't understand why there's a women's own heart. I mean I do because then there's both, but like I don't know. I just feel like there's not like it's not like the women are like Owen Hart. I don't think that like other than Deeb, like yeah, I don't know. You know. I'm just trying to think like I feel like in the men's division, like you could like put in like I obviously I don't think that's what they're going to do, but no, like, they're just naming it. There's after more him. like Owen Hart like stuff, and I don't know. It's just like it's Owen Hart like you do like a Martha Hart or something. It's just gonna be a lot of tournament matches, right? And they'll seem to drag them out sometimes. So I don't what? know. No, they and, wouldn't do that. And there's not a lot of talking about it, so sometimes I forget, to be honest. I just noticed the Trons. Right. Um, they had Owen Hart on the Trons. Um, there's a snap to fix one count by Storm. Strike exchange after the commercial break that was in the middle of the match, hence why there are not a lot of noted yep, spots. Yep, love half is on commercial again. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fisherman suplex for two by Storm. Death Valley Driver by Bunny for two. Uh, Storm Zero, even though it wasn't Storm Zero, it was just this weird short pile driver. Um, that got the win for Storm. I actually thought this match over delivered for me. I kind of liked it. I thought even you have said that Tony Storm looks like a star, right? She has a kind of a star quality to her and a really good look. Uh, um, she looked better here than she did in NXT. She showcased some pretty good looking offense suplexes. I liked the quick pile driver at the end. I know you didn't like it that much, but I thought debuting her and adding her to this tournament's a good move. Um. A surprise arrival is fine, too, as most fans know who she is, and a lot of people really like her. So I want to like her. I know she has had good matches. I know she was awesome in stardom and stuff. So she just did not look good in NXT during that time. So I'm going to blame or that. UK. I'm going to blame that on them and maybe not really? her so much. A lot of people look good in NXT, though. But like, um, And she wasn't even in 2.0. I know, but I don't know what it is. So I'm hoping that I like this match and... I thought Bunny looked all right, too, for her, so I had no issue with this, and I don't know, we'll see where Storm goes, but she looked pretty good here, I thought, and then you will disagree. Go ahead. It was fine, but <laughs> I'll just say it sucks, because it was the only match the women got this week, and it was just, like, not that great. Like, this is all the, that this is all they get for the week. It was. I thought it was a pretty decent competitive match, to be honest. For Bunny and Tony Storm, Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, if I had to put A B W women's matches, I want to see on the list. Bunny versus Tony Storm would be either far, far, far down the list or not on the list at all. Right. Um, I guess the rumors were true, so that sucks because Tony Storm is not the worst signing they can make, but she's also not a good signing. Um, if she didn't look good in NXT, I can't say that she'll like that she's good. Like I feel like you, if you're gonna look good in NXT, or like if you're gonna look good, you would have looked good in NXT. I don't, just don't think she was Maybe very good. Maybe it's the style there that she had trouble with or opponents or that who was knows. when they were doing actual wrestling though but she's had good matches all over the world so i don't she's clearly Except capable for nxt which i don't okay. like it's nxt okay. you hate her we get it like i don't understand how you don't have good matches there i know and bunny we all know how good she is despite <laughs> her wealth of experience mm-hmm. um if you didn't see this you can imagine how it went um okay match but i didn't care i guess tony storm's here now so that sucks yep um, next we have Vicky Nyla. Um, Rose says Rosa won't be the foundation. She will be. She's a cornerstone of the division since day one. Rose says Rosa seems to have death wish. She'll grant it. So it's just okay. I don't really care about this because Nyla Rose is not winning. The sound. Also, was... I don't like going Rose Rosa. Yes, the, the sound, sound was, the was out of whack really too. Bad. I didn't. 
talk about the Vicky line, but it was like really like the sound was not good. I don't know what Vicky adds to Nyla's presentation at this point because Nyla's fine when she speaks. Like I don't, she's not one of those people like Cage or something where I'm like, yes, they need a mouthpiece. She doesn't. She sounded fine here. And Vicky for me is like go away heat. I don't want her there. And I don't know if the crowd reaction is the same or not, but I don't know what she's adding. I'm not sure why she's there. She could disappear as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, Nyla sounded fine here. Yeah, I I don't know. It was it was okay, but I just didn't like it was really short. So it was. I, like I don't think like I think once they got the um once they got the audio better, like it was fine because I thought Vicky sounded like really like not great at the beginning then like it kind of like, i think it was like, like mid line they kind of got it under. you could hear like too much of the crowd and i think tony was holding the mic too far away from vicky to start but yeah it got better when nyla spoke for sure uh next we come to our main event which is andrade el idolo versus darby allen and um as darby's walking down for his entrance um andrade hits that corkscrew dive to the outside so starts right away it looked good and andrade is looking humongous like he's considerably bigger than he yeah. was in nxt um andrade like suplex drops darby on the steel stairs which were turned on its side looked good yeah mm -hmm. it's a and good then, attack um after a bit the match starts um running double knees in the corner by andrade for two uh but darby grabbed the ropes darby countered a crucifix bomb like a razor's edge into a code red for two which is pretty cool mm-hmm uh, there was like a slap fight that just kept going, which is funny. Goodness. And Darby went to hit, and then he just got absolutely paintbrushed by uh, Andrade. There was an Iranagi backbreaker for two by Andrade. Avalanche crucifix bomb when, with Andrade leaning on his stomach, and Darby applies the Fujiwara armbar until Offo interference comes in, and Darby drives to take them out. Um, but Andrade is able to win with a buckle bomb and the hammerlock DT, and Offo assault. Sting and Darby until the Hardys make the save and they hit finishers on Mark Quinn. So we get our third group run in and brawling after stuff right. outside of a match. Um, I thought Andrade's attack before the match looked really good. It also gave the crowd something to react to when Allen made his inevitable comeback. Um, this was a standard Darby Allen match, except he didn't get the win, right? Like normally we say like he lets the other person look amazing and beat the hell out of him, and then he pulls out the win at the end. So he didn't get the win here, but other than that... But he it got was... some cool moves, actually. He did, actually. The um, the crucifix off the ropes with, like, an extra half rotation into the armbar was pretty cool. Yeah, that was cool. And I think Andrade is looking really, really good lately. Um, What was the match I loved on Rampage? It was it three-way he was in? It was them and then Guevara. Yeah, that match was amazing. So I think Andrade's on a roll here, other than his involvement with the AFO, which I wish would go away. But anyways, I'm happy that he picked up a quality win here because that guy needs gold. The, his character and just his look, having a belt look, is, helps him a lot. He just looks amazing as a champion, so I'm hoping they find a way to get a belt on him at some point. So I thought this was a really good main event. I quite enjoyed it, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this a lot, too. Uh, one of Andrade's best in AWS. He's kind of been in a lull lately, I feel like. Um, the pre-match brawl went a little long, but it wasn't too bad either. Uh, stair spot and the code red were my favorites, and uh, the avalanche crucifix bomb was really cool too. Uh, working Darby really helped Andrade here because he took a lot of offense, took it like a champ, and Darby could afford the loss here. I think a big solo win from Andra for Andrade yep. with the right move. I agree. Um, main event was definitely a pickup from last week. I liked it more for sure. What was last week's main event? Uh, Jazz versus. Oh yeah. Silver Reynolds. Yeah. Um, so overall, I thought this was another entertaining episode of Dynamite. Um, the Punk Caster opener was fine. I enjoyed quite a bit the Yuta Danielson match and the main event. And I would say Storm, Tony Storm and Bunny over delivered for me. I thought that was a solid match as well. Um, promo wise, Jade at least did something different. The JAS segment was fine, but the brawl was far too long. And then everything else was pr pretty standard stuff. So I thought it was a B plus show for me. Very good, but a notch below the very best episodes of Dynamite. Like, there were two matches I really liked on the show. I would say on the A-level shows, there's three, at least, that I like. So, um, yeah, I would give it a B plus. What about you? We'll get the charger when we're done. Just oh. <laughs> we'll pause right after you say what you're going to say here. So, go ahead. Um, yeah, I thought it was solid. I liked the, I think the opener was fine. Um, Lethal Moxley was better. Uh, FDR Gun Club was mostly just a segment or like a storyline setup match. That was alright. I really liked Daniels and Yuta. Uh, the women's match was meh, and the main <laughs> event I really liked. Um, so the matches are pretty good. I think the 
for segments, I think the jazz segment was not too long. The best undisputed air segment I liked. Um, MJF uh, got a good promo. FTR's promo was solid. Um, Cargill was all right. Uh, the Thunder Rose and Nyla Rose stuff was not the best. Um, I think overall, a fine show. Some of the matches were really good, but I feel like it gets dragged down by some stuff like the jazz segment or some of the lesser matches. Yes. So I'm gonna go with a B, uh, just short of a B plus. That's fair. Yeah, so a good show, but not one of their amazing ones. Right. And that's going to lead us into talking about some trivia in a segment we like to call Off the Top of His Head. I like this week's topic. So we're looking at interesting facts about WWE you probably won't believe. Even though you probably know all of them, you still won't believe them. (laughs) You could know the answers and not believe it still, I guess. Which of these legendary superstars never won a single title? Okay. Ultimate Warrior, Chris Benoit, Randy Savage, Jake the Snake Roberts. Jake Snake Roberts. Correct. So there's like, only... He's like one of the famous ones that never did anything. Right. There's only 20 of these, so we will maybe do all of them. I actually knew the answer to that one. I knew Jake never won any championships. Which of these former German national football team members became a WWE wrestler. Wow. Tim Wise, Franz Beckenbauer, Jurgen Klinsmann, or Joachim Lowe? Have you heard Last of one. Really? Have you heard of him? I don't know. Or are you just guessing? Yeah. It is Tim Wise, the huh. first one. That is a hard question. Which of these WWE superstars once fell asleep while competing in a match against Big John Studd? Hulk Hogan, Bruno San Martino, Stone Cold Steve Austin or Andre the Giant? Uh, Who fell asleep? What was the second one? Bruno San Martino. Uh, Andre. It is, in fact, Andre the Giant. I have not heard of these so far. So you Me might neither. Be, you might be guessing a bunch on these. We found a topic you don't know. Which of these superstars initially used CM Punk's Fire Burns theme music? Ready? Kane, John Cena, Randy Orton, Edge. Orton. Correct. Did you know that one? No, it just sounded like something that they would do. <laughs> True or false? Edge and Kristen began their time in the WWE playing the role of brothers. Yeah. They sure did for a long time, and then it just sort of disappeared, right? And they became friends. Um, yeah. Which of these superstars won a title at age 19, making him the youngest champion ever? Randy Dupree. Correct. You don't even need, I was going to say, do you even need the list for this one? Which WrestleMania event? Did not feature any men's singles matches. Interesting. WrestleMania 2000. Which is what number? 16. Correct. So what was going on in that one then? There's a lot of multi-man matches. The only singles match was, I think, Terry versus the cat. Oh or, my god. Or, I think, yeah. That's an iconic match for sure. Number eight. Which of these WWE superstars was formerly a basketball player in Texas? Ready? Undertaker. Great Khali. Triple H, Titus O'Neil. So think of Titus O'Neil. Think of the state in Texas. Who's from Texas? Taker. Correct. And he's very tall. A match between these two superstars is the only match to close a pay per view and open the next one. So the pay per views were Breaking Point 2009, and then the same match opened Hell in a Cell. Punk and Taker. And the answer is, in fact, The Undertaker versus CM Punk. So you're wrong. You said Punk and Taker. Oh, right. <laughs> That's how much of a stickler I have to be for you to be wrong. <laughs> All except one of these wrestlers are among the only five to have won five separate titles. Does that make sense? All except one. Okay. So who hasn't won all five titles is a better way of saying What's it. What's all five titles? I don't know. Grand but Slam. You're, you're, it, Kurt Angle, Jeffrey Hardy, Jeffrey Nero Hardy, Randall Keith Orton, or Chris insert middle name of your choosing jericho (laughs) so who hasn't won all five separate titles angle it is not angle jeffrey it is not jeffrey randall correct randall orton which superstar featured on the cover of the very first wwe magazine hulk hogan for heart he is not an option do you want options for heart not an option do you want options yeah Savage, Owen Hart, Carlito, or Vader? Savage? No. <laughs> it was Carlito, wasn't it? No. Okay, I don't know. Vader. 
Oh. I'm crushing you. Why the hell is Carlito in there? <laughs> True or false? No title in WWE history has changed hands more time than the WWE Tag Team Championship. I don't think we're including the 24-7 in this. True. Correct, it is true. Hmm. Which of these WWE superstars has spent the most time in the ring? Orton, Mysterio, Cena, Punk. Orton. That's a weird question. The answer is not Randy Orton. Jonathan. No. Mysterio. Really? Yes. And I don't know, has spent more time in the ring. So are they saying they've added up the time of all of his matches or he's had more matches, right? Like, I don't know. Um, interesting question. Which WWE superstar has forfeited the most titles? Do you want options? Yes. Triple H, Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Shawn Michaels. Triple H with those damn quads. Nope. Ah, uh, uh, Cena. Nope. Shawn Michaels. Ah, uh, Shawn Michaels. Oh, ah, uh, I should have known. You should have known now that you now that you think about it. Which of these superstars fought against members of the Evolution in three unforgiven pay per view events in three different years? What? So let's look at that again. Which of these superstars? Fought against members of Evolution in three Unforgiven pay-per-view events in three different years. So three straight Unforgivens, this person fought people from Evolution. Options are okay. Edge, Mr. Kennedy, Carlito, or Rob Van Dam? Edge. No. Rob Van Dam. No. Kennedy. No. Other guy. Carlito. <laughs> Carlito? Is... Yeah. The hell? Which of these superstars never competed at any SummerSlam? Ready? Yep. Darren Young, Christian, Roddy Piper, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Roddy Piper. Correct. This sounded like a weird one. Which two superstars were the first to feature using their real names in a WrestleMania main event? You ready? Options are? Yeah. Cena Orton, Lesnar Angle, Shane McMahon, Shawn Michaels, Vince McMahon, Ric Flair. Lesnar Angle. Correct. True or false, from 2005 to 2010, the last superstar to be eliminated in a Royal Rumble match ended up winning the world title match at WrestleMania. So the last person to be eliminated ended up winning the world title from 2005 to 2010. Uh-huh. Uh, true or false? That's true. It is false, but I know that happened to Cena. The last superstars to be eliminated between that time frame were all involved in WrestleMania title matches, so they all made title matches, didn't necessarily win. Second last question: Three different superstars have won Royal Rumble matches, entering immediately after which superstar? These are hard this week. So you get that? Sorry, I'm going to say that again. Three different superstars have won the Royal Rumble matches. Entering immediately after which of these people? Triple H, Kurt Angle, Kane, The Undertaker. Kane. No. Oh, he's been these are hard, Triple man. H. Yes. <laughs> these are super why hard. Why would I know these? All right. That's why I like this. is my favorite one ever. <laughs> <laughs> which of these two superstars was involved in a personal brawl about protein shakes? <laughs> Ready? Orton and Cena. Sincaro and Del Rio, Sincara, sorry, and Del Rio, Yoshi Tatsu and Sheamus, Bobby Lashley and Eric Rowan. Who fought over Yoshi protein? Tatsu and Sheamus? That is correct. <laughs> that just Dang it! Right. On the one, the one off the top of his head that you didn't know a ton of stuff, you got the last one right. It's not what we're going. Oh well, yeah, I'm determined to make you not win. But I think that ends the hardest ever. I would. Yeah, you say? that's fair. Eighty nine weeks of off the top of his head, and this <laughs> yeah. is by far the fewest you got it was right. Really weird. Yeah. So take that. You don't know much about wrestling, I guess, <laughs> or obscure details that right. nobody would know. Anyways, we'll finish up there and, and go back to talking about some weekly wrestling show, which this point is going to be us taking a quick look at NXT UK. So NXT UK this week started out with a hot rematch eh, between Amal <laughs> taking on Zaya Brookside. Um, Amal dominates early, including a somersault move of some type and a suplex. Brookside gets her turn, hits the running double knees to Amal's back in the corner. Camel clutch a little later by Zaya. Kick to the gut, running knee to the head, and a northern light suplex by Amal for a nice flurry and a near fall. Running boot to Zaya along the barricade as they take the fight outside. Someone from the crowd attacks Amal, 
while the ref is dealing with Brookside in the ring. And then we get the, once back in the ring, Brookside hits the broken wings to Amal and picks up the victory here. Um, I thought the match was totally fine. I actually liked Amal's flurries a little bit. It furthers Brookside's story, I guess, and the feud with Amal is clearly going to continue. Commentary, myself, I don't think you knew who Brookside's help is. They did not mention her by name yet. But it's obviously, I don't know if you remember last week, but Zaya Brookside was on the phone with her daddy and it sounded like she was bringing somebody to help her. So it looks like we're getting um, a new talent, which could be interesting, right? Who's going to be, I don't know if it's um, Brookside's muscle or lackey or whatever it is, but I guess we'll find out. I thought this was an acceptable but not special opener. You? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember much from it. I was half watching because I didn't care. Right. And like, I don't know. Just I don't know who the help was. That's fine, I guess. I don't really care about Brookside. And like, I don't think a mall's bad. She's getting a little bit too much for me with her. And she's positioned where she would like. It makes sense because the way they're positioned right now, a mall would be beating Brookside if everything were equal, right? So she needed some sort of cheating shenanigans to beat. Amal, which I guess will lead to a third and final match, hopefully. But yeah, it was it was an okay opener, nothing right. special. Uh, so Isla Dawn vignette here. She's being creepy and strange. It's all dark and gothic sort of theme here. Um, she says Mako will do whatever Dawn asks if Mako wants to see her title again, because as we know, Isla Dawn likes to collect trophies. So even though she lost to Mako, right, she took the title away and still has it. So she did say a lot more than that, but that was basically the gist of it really stylish kind of looking gothic segment i was fine with it she has this dark character that i like but so far she's kind of avoiding anything supernatural it's more like malachi black i guess in AEW, where they're dark and they do but they don't do any magic right they're not so i i I have no problem with isla dawn's character i think i like it more than you do but i thought this was an okay vignette yeah it was okay i think it's like i don't know i think it's kind of it's that trope of like you got like and now she's like, what is it gonna be her slave? Cause she has a title belt. Like I don't know. It's just kind of like I think I don't think it's bad. It's just I, I don't know, need to see more of that. I don't love like the stolen belt trope all the time. Me either. And it just happened in Dynamite as well. So we're getting a lot of that right now. Um, we then have a little vignette where members of the UK roster are taking turns talking about the strong Dragonov match that will take place next week for the NXT UK Championship. Basically, everybody is putting over the match being something exciting to watch until it ends with Jordan Devlin, who he doesn't care who wins because he's going to beat whoever it is anyways to take the title. Um, So I do like it when they make it seem like the wrestlers themselves are excited for a match. I think that does. I, I don't think you can use it too often, right? But when it's used sparingly, it can help the match feel more legitimate because like people inside the industry really want to see it too. So I like when they use it. And it makes sense because Strong and Dragonov could be a fantastic match, right? So I have high hopes for next week. So I thought this was a cool little segment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm. Um, I don't know. I thought it was solid. I'm getting like half watching sometimes, but because what we watched it like late last night, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trent Seven taking on Ashton Smith in the next match. So basically, here if Smith can beat Seven. Smith and Carter get because another Carter shot. Because Carter already, beat, right, which beat, is one of the weeks we missed. But right. I did see that like he won. They actually um showed us the finish. So if Smith can somehow beat Seven here, they'll get another. Smith and Carter, that is, will get another shot at the right. tag championships. So it's back and forth to start with Seven eventually hitting a suplex before repeated chops while maintaining wrist control of Smith. We get a power slam and a snake eyes from Smith that turns the tide eventually. Smith's then in control. Seven tries to fire up, but takes a running boot in the corner instead. Smith catches Seven coming off the second rope, transitions into a vertical suplex, which I thought was a pretty impressive looking spot. Uh, Smith then is up top, takes a bit too long, and Seven catches him with a superplex. Seven then, um, because he's been doing this thing about saying he'll do anything to keep the titles, he hits a cheap shot behind the ref's back and a dragon suplex and a cool-looking driver slam thing that even Jack couldn't identify is what my notes say yeah, I, for a near I, fall. I was like... Because you're usually my guy, go, what is that? And you were like, like uh, It's like something uh, from TK. <laughs> right. Uh, so Seven wins with a handful of tights as bait is <gasps> on, on the floor looking on sort of disapprovingly here. So it's kind of exactly where I thought this was going, right? Um, I like the match, actually. I thought it was good. It logically furthers that storyline kind of where I think it's going right, the splintering of Mustache Mountain because Seven's willing to take shortcuts and cheat 
to hang on to the belts and Tyler Bate is not comfortable with that at all. Um, and that's what Seven's been saying. And I guess this is the proof we need that there is some sort of friction between the guys in Mustache Mountain. I thought this was a good TV match and it's furthering a story of a probable like tag team split. So what did you think of it? Um, I think the match was okay. I don't think like, I feel like Carter's the better half. I think I agree. These I are like the Carter lesser better. halves of both teams. Yeah, actually, I agree with that as well. Um, but I just don't think Ashton Smith that, is that interesting. And he's not bad. He's just he still has a bit of a jobber stink to me. But also, like I just don't think he's that interesting. He's like he's okay in the ring, but he's just not like he's just like missing something. I You're guess. Right. Like, I think Trent Seven saw it. Like I give him a better opponent. I think it, he's great. But I just don't think uh, Ashton Smith is the best. So I think it's okay. I think the finish works fine. I think it continues that storyline. So I like that. But as a match, it was just okay. Yeah, Smith, I think, is good in the ring. But he does not, like, charisma-wise or anything, I think is missing, right? He's not an entertaining character at this point. But I think he's good in the ring. Uh, So we get A-Kid. He says he's ready to step up and take on the head of the Familia in Teoman. Um... And I, that, that was basically it. I, I imagine he's going to put Teo Man over because, as we know, A-Kid is in North America wrestling for NXT 2.0. So I imagine Teo Man gets the win, and I'm happy about that because I like the Familia, but we've been saying like they just need to start stringing together some quality wins, and that would be one. So And the match should be good, right? Teo Man and um, A-Kid interests me, so I'm hoping yeah, it's good. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, I, I thought this was, it was nothing special. Obviously. Yeah, it was alright. Just pretty standard, but I, I think that could be a cool match, yeah. yeah. We then get Wild Boar is holding a crutch, and he says that he will continue cutting all the puppet strings until he Shouldn't gets to he Eddie like Dennis. he have like a machete or something? Which I thought was a cool line, right? Again, he's dealing with all the underlings trying to get to the final boss of Eddie Dennis. Uh, he then gets super intense, starts throwing and smashing things, I actually thought it was pretty cool. He showed some good intensity here. Um, and at least they're trying to tell a story. I would appreciate myself, because I don't know if I was watching at that point, a recap of like how Wild Boar and Dennis got to this point. Like whatever got Wild yeah. Boar thrown out of symbiosis, or if they were called that beforehand, I don't even remember. Or like, did I need he a get recap. injured? Or, I want to say he was in the speaking of movement, but that was like also a really long time ago right. now. So, so obviously they won't recap that if that's yeah. the case, but... I would like some sort of, I get that they... For sure, I'm definitely missing something. Because I remember he was in the tag team, and obviously they all hate each other, but I would love a, even a verbal recap of what the dynamic there is. But I still thought this was cool. Um, Smith and Carter are backstage, and they're mad, obviously, as Mustache Mountain walk up. Seven just calls it a win, and I forget what he's something about it, like a veteran something. Anyways, basically, like, I'm an experienced person, so you got to be willing to do stuff like that. Uh, they argue a little bit. Sid Scala shows up, says they'll have they'll talk about it in his office next week. Um, so Smith and Carter leave, and Mustache Mountain are there together and have a moment where Bate is clearly not comfortable with Seven's actions, just furthering this idea that Bate's not on board with taking shortcuts, and I guess setting up a segment next week in Sid Scala's office. So I don't know. It was it was fine. It was a standard thing. I didn't hate it, but I don't really have much to say about it. You. Um, yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, I guess that's something next week. Um, I don't know. I feel like there could be, like, some sort of stipulation for the match then. Like, maybe that's what they're going to work out. There probably should be something at like this that. point. Yeah. Where maybe, like, Mustache they Mountain loses the titles, the titles by, by DQ, DQ. Or no DQ match. And maybe, that's too much. And but... maybe, like, it would actually be cool if Bates the one to suggest that, right? If yeah. If he's the one to go, true. like, we don't need to take shortcuts. In fact... In, we'll give you a yeah. match, and if we if we cheat, you guys can have the titles. Yeah. And then Seven can kind of be like, what the heck, man, and further that a little bit, right? Yeah. Might, might no, work. that's smart. I, yeah, they should do that then. Because, we'll like, see. usually I really don't like that stipulation. I feel like it's kind of lame. It just, like, right. kind of takes... But I think that works. Like, if it's Bait trying to rein Seven in, being like, right. we don't need yeah, to yeah. take these shortcuts, I think that works. buddy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we then get a guy I've never heard of, Tate Mayfair. I have Mayfair's uh, with an S, but I'm not sure if that's right. I think right. that's right. It is right. Okay. I'm almost positive. Taking on Kenny Williams. <laughs> I laughed because Kenny Williams is, is like startled by the bell ringing to start the match. So I thought that was like you're a professional right, wrestler. Right, she's just like paranoid probably kind of with funny. that Gradwell. And yeah, um, that's right. I guess that's where it's going. So Williams attacks right away with aggressive strikes and stomps. Tate lands some punches, but Williams attacks his leg. Uh, Williams hits some shots to the back of Mayfair's head before applying a submission. Then we get another flurry for Tate Mayfair's before a dragon screw in the ropes by Williams. We get a body slam on the floor uh, by Kenny Williams and like the forward DDT. It was the original um, 
Dirty Deeds, wasn't it? That is correct. Yes. Um, once they're back in the ring, but Williams pulls Tate up before the three. So it's the classic heel. He could have pinned him here, but he decided not to just to do more punishment. So then Mayfair's is out on the floor and he kind of crawls under the ring, which For is a some reason. bit of an awkward spot, right? Because that's not something that happens in a wrestling match. So Yeah, it was, it was weird. Kind of telegraphs what's happening. And of course, guess who comes out from under the ring? It's Sam Gradwell. He rolls Mayfair uh, in. I'm here, Jordan. Into the ring, stops Williams from getting back in, basically just sort of standing in his way. And the referee just allows that. Like, that's legal. You can just stop a guy from getting into the ring and then force him to lose by count out, I guess. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't a fan of this. I, I don't know why Williams was struggling so much to get the win in the first place against the guy I've never heard of. Like, I get that he pulled him up from the pin, but Mayfair's did get a, a fair amount of offense in this. And it's furthering a feud that I'm not really interesting it, interested in. It seems like with us... Seems like Kenny Williams did him a favor. <laughs> there's always this one story I feel like is getting too much time on a one-hour show, right? And that's... It was... I feel like um, this is replacing the vest. It, Mastiff and Stars, Quest right? for the vest. Where we're like, why are these guys on so much? And right. it, Gradwell and Williams. I kind of like Williams as a heel, but... I this, don't think this is the this isn't, use. Right. It's not doing much for me. So I don't think... This was my, like my weak spot on this show. I didn't really think this match or story too interesting but right. anyways yeah i agree uh wolfgang is backstage he says that mark coffee is ready for his match tonight but then he's interrupted by d familia um well, why can't i remember his first name dempsey charlie my goodness charlie dempsey asks why gallus are the only ones that seem to get shots at the heritage cup makes sense and a match between sure, dempsey because they've literally made the point that neither of them have much experience in the division like the coffee right that which is a fair point right um, and so it looks like we're going to be getting a Dempsey Wolfgang match being set up, which I hope is a win win for Dempsey because Wolfgang can't see it being Wolfgang. I think but... Wolfgang's fine, but I don't really, again, he's not somebody I would focus my company on for any degree. He's there to sort of put other people over if I had my choice, but I guess we'll yeah, see. for sure. So Dragunov and Strong are doing a quick little sit down with the guy whose name I can never remember uh, to talk ahead of their match. Um, they, I know oh, this. Uh, I don't know. I don't either. Uh, so they respect each other basically and put this over as like a serious contest. Uh, Roddy has felt losing a title and Ilya still hasn't. So I don't quite understand why that's an advantage for Roderick Strong to <laughs> he bring knows up. What like, it, he listen, knows what it's like to lose. I've lost a whole bunch of titles and you haven't. So that's an advantage. So for I'm you? better than I don't. You. I guess it means like I guess the point is he knows how crappy it feels to lose, so he's motivated to win it, and Ilya. I, I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. Um, they, they stand up getting each other's face briefly, and Ilya says he will stand tall against Roderick Strong. Some would say he might stand and deliver. Eh, just so, kidding. He's not on the show. So Roddy is not good on the mic, but I thought this was pretty fair for him, yeah. actually. Roddy is the best on the mic. I thought the final part where Roddy spoke was about as good as he does, and honestly, this could be one hell of a match, right? So yeah. here's hoping. Here's hoping. Uh, main event, it's Mark Coffey taking on Noam Dar in a Heritage Cup championship match i guess we'll say it is um so round one is really technical to start which of course noam dar would have the advantage as coffee is less of a technician than dar uh in the middle of his domination dar goes over and takes a drink from his flask and then takes a moment to pour some of the contents onto joe coffee who's at ringside and then dar has coffee in a submission as the bell rings to save coffee round two dar is quickly targeting coffee's left arm coffee lands a huge forearm uh, but Dar lures him in and rolls him up for the first fall, and that ends round two really quickly. Um, and they talk about, you know, Coffee fell for it. He basically walked right into Dar's trap sort of thing. So Dar is like the technical guy who's also outsmarting Mark Coffee at this point. Round three, Coffee really takes it to Dar here, which is what I like about these matches, right? Because once one person gets a pinfall, the other person becomes like desperate, and I find it right. adds a lot to the match. It's yeah. usually in around this third round. Uh, so he takes it to Dar with strikes and a back body drop. Uh, Iranagi by Coffee. Uh, Shaw Samuels pulls Dar to safety before Coffee ends up taking out Shaw Samuels on the outside. And then we get, it looked pretty cool, a, a leaping kick to the head by Coffee. And he pins Dar here to put it at one fall apiece. So then we head to round four. Dar starts out uh, landing strikes before Coffee picks him up and slams him. Dar kicks out Coffee's left leg, hits a nice running boot before getting caught by a coffee clothesline. And then I enjoy the name of this, the champagne super knee bar. 
And yeah, coffee, I like that. coffee is again saved by the bell because there's a famous song called Champagne Supernova. I don't know if you know that, but anyways, that's what it's well, a and, reference. Oh, to. wait, yeah, yeah, and yes, he is I know the, that one. And he is the Scottish Supernova, right? Yeah, I know, so. I, I know that. I think it's one of those ones that's on the radio every right. now and then. It is. Uh, so, Coffee saved by the bell. We go to round five, starts out with a strike exchange, a nice back elbow by Dar for a near fall, submission by Coffee, but he has to break it to deal with Shaw Samuels, who's still being a pest there at ringside. Um, Joe Coffee ends up chasing Shaw away, and Dar takes that opportunity to hit the Nova Roller, which is just that like leaping. It's just heel like an integrity, sort of. I yeah. think. But it looks cool. Um, and he picks up the win here. So I thought this was another entertaining Heritage Cup match, and I'm not even a huge fan of Mark Coffee, but I feel like they've really mastered the formula of these matches, right? There's first of all, there's always stakes involved because it seems like it's always for the cup. There's never like heritage rules match that aren't for the cup it seems so except for that one number one contenders one with Aiken right. and Fraser well even that there would have been stakes so there's always stakes involved and the intensity kind of builds after the first pinfall or the second one or whatever right so I think that the formula is really good here um I thought both men looked good this was a good main event they cut a couple of the rounds short with the pinfalls which is fine by me so I actually thought this was a good it, not an amazing main event but I enjoyed it I thought it was good what about you yeah, I like I like these matches. I think I mean obviously I don't. I wish it wasn't the coffees because like I just don't like that. It's like they're not Heritage Cup guys to it's me. It's not they're that more... it's bad. It's just it bugs me that like Joe Coffee got in like, and he literally never had a Heritage Cup match right. before. Like that's just kind of a a bad sign to me. Like and it not seems like even it's for a certain a style match. of like the technician sort of thing. Right, right. Like and I think Dempsey should get in. I agree. Like I or a kid like. Even Fraser, to an extent, yep. like I don't think they fit. Like I think it was, I think it was good. I think uh, Coffee got in a decent bit, and then I think Dara was cool again. Me too. But I don't like that. It's just like they're getting shots despite like not being the type of people and just not like having had any experience at all. I think these are consistently like my favorite. I don't know specialty matches or whatever you'd call them. Like you know what I mean? Because companies try to come up with these matches that are somewhat original and unique to them. I think the Heritage Cup works really well, actually. I mean. Neither of us really like that it's a giant cup you have to carry around. I think around. a Heritage Championship would be so much cooler. But the but match I... type is cool. Yeah. And it certainly like lends itself to certain styles of performers. I like that too. Uh, so overall thoughts on this show. I thought it was fine, but not amazing. I don't think anything was bad. I enjoyed the Seven Smith match and the main event. The Kenny Williams match and the, and the other stuff involved with that. That was a miss for me. Uh, everything else was fine. I liked the Wild Boar segment. I thought it was a B mu- B minus this week. Enjoyable, but nothing to get excited about. Like almost a B, but I would say a B minus this week. That's it. Fair. None of the matches like excited a lot. I think the Heritage Cup match was probably the best, but nothing it amazing. Was, Segments sure. were all fine. So I think B minus is fair. Nothing horrible, but just wasn't like outstanding. Right, and it was a quick watch. It's not a chore to get through, unlike yeah. what I'm about to talk about next. But Ooh. anyways, so let's transition into that, where we're heading into our section where we talk about any other wrestling business. All right, so let's talk about some NXT 2.0. It is the Stand and Deliver Go Home show, correct? Yeah. And we're starting out with Imperium. Imperium is making their entrance as the show starts, and they get attacked from behind on the ramp by LA Knight and MSK, who are their opponents in this opening match. So this match seemed to feature LA Knight, um, and he and Bartel specifically seemed to spend a lot of time in the ring on this one. So I thought LA Knight showed good intensity here. They did a good job keeping Knight and Walter away from each other for most of this because I think that's the match that... Are they at Stand and Deliver? Yes. I think so, right? So they kind of stopped them from touching for most of this. Uh, Carter seemed to overshoot his target on a dive to the floor and he landed awkwardly. At one point, Walter knocks Carter off the ropes and to the apron. So LA Knight comes over and starts to brawl with Walter and they end up brawling like out up to the back and they are gone from this match for the end of it so the finish comes when imperium makes a blind tag carter tries to pin bartell who's not the legal man eichner knocks lee off the apron turns around and turns carter inside out with a huge clothesline as bartell was holding on to carter's ankle at the time so imperium pick up the win off of that move in about 12 minutes um I actually enjoyed this match i thought that it was a strong opener for nxt 2.0 i thought la knight looked really good 
And Eichner's always impressive, right? There's just the power stuff he can do mixed in with yeah. his ability to high fly. There wasn't much Walter in this match, but I still like the opener. So this show was off to a pretty good start for me. And guess what? There's a theme here. When you put veterans together who can wrestle in matches, the matches are generally pretty good. When you put brand new people in a three or four minute match, there's not much I can say about it, right? So that seems to be the point in this show this week. That's interesting. So Kaylee Ray and Io Shirai are talking. They agree that they will beat Toxic Attraction for the tag team titles, but then they quickly start to disagree about who will go for the NXT women's title next. There's a little bit of tension between them to end the segment. How will they ever get along, right? It's teammates that don't get along. What a brand new idea for a wrestling tag team. <laughs> um, but to be honest, I actually like the interaction between the two. It makes sense that they both want a shot at Mandy Rose at this point, right? It feels more realistic than most storylines on the show, right? It's two people who have a lot of championship pedigree who think they should be next in line for the title. That's a really simple, realistic story. And on a show full of cartoon characters and like, adolescent storylines this one makes total sense to me so hopefully they can beat toxic attraction together and get the belts off toxic attraction um and then maybe they could fight each other for a shot at rose i don't know but anyways i like the little segment there dakota kai is backstage looking for wendy chu and kai finds chu's sleeping stuff all cut up and destroyed on the floor because she died oh no we get footage from earlier this week showing <laughs> us that tatum paxley is trying to clean up the Diamond Mine gym to get in their good books, I guess. She wants to be part of Diamond Mine, and that's how she's starting out. I guess that's like being a young boy or something. Ha, uh, yes. Ivy Nye tells her to get out, and that Diamond Mine kick ass, not kiss ass. Okay, sure. Well, we then get well. uh, Tiffany Stratton taking on Ivy Nile. And Saray, thank goodness, I know you were worried, bud, and you lost sleep all week this week. Saray did find her necklace. Oh. It was like under a Coke machine or something backstage. She pulls it out from under something. So all is right with the universe. Okay, she has her necklace. Uh, There's actually a nice standing moonsault by Stratton. Sort of an awkward multiple near fall spot, followed by a lengthy, weak-looking submission by Stratton. Superman punch, running kick to Stratton's face in the corner. Then a submission leading to like a wicked stepsister, basically. A pretty nice sequence from Niall. When there's smoke appears on the ramp, Saray appears as well. Just as Stratton has taken control, of course, we get a counter by Niall into her dragon sleeper submission, and it's over in three and a half minutes. Um, I thought the match was good and bad. Stratton started out looking good, then she got a little bit awkward in the middle, and then Niall had a really nice flurry, but at the end of the day, it's just another, like, four-minute, three-and-a-half-minute WWE distraction finish match, right? Like, decent enough, but what can you say? And it's kind of lazy writing. It's just what you would expect, so nothing special. Champa in, is in his usual spot where he cuts promos sitting on a chair in front of a garage door. He says he's been here a long time. He's had ups and downs, lots of obstacles, but the fans have always been there. At Stand and Deliver, he and the crowd are doing this one last time. Then instead of throwing the chair like he usually does to end his promos, he leans it against the door and it has uh, spray painted on it his NXT start and finishing date. So... I like this. It wasn't super long, but it sounded really sincere from Champa. Really Champa. telegraphing the... Yeah, of course. And I, they just, I think they just want to let people know so they're not surprised, right? And it's appropriate for a guy like Champa before he leaves. Again, like I've said before, it is less sad that he's leaving because it is NXT 2.0 and not gold and black. Um, so it's not really a big deal if people leave because they're not going to get used properly anyways. Um, we then get a Ziggler video. He's won a lot of titles. This is DZ 2.0. He's then in a car riding somewhere talking as he goes, talking about Braun and how he's not very famous compared to Ziggler. (laughs) We we get highlights of Ziggler promoting NXT Stand and Deliver in multiple interviews, lots of hype for the match and the pay-per-view. Ziggler was fine here, but I mean, I, I say it all the time. He's been tainted by his treatment on main roster for so many years. You can't at this point convince me that this guy is a star right because he is bottom of the barrel have a good match never win maybe in a tag team and nobody in the main roster cares about tag teams at all so if this kind of felt long for me i guess it did what it did in terms of promoting what it was designed to but again i'm just not like i don't see ziggler as a star and this amazing performer right he's he's not anymore 
Uh, Cora Jade's reviewing her journal and oh, her man. love of wrestling. She respects the title and lists, I think, almost all of the people who have held it so far. She puts over all yeah, of... Yeah, I saw it. I was just waiting for her to say Baszler. Yes, she puts over all of her opponents that stand and deliver, but she's going to win, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's more, but who really cares? Uh, actually, it was much better than she usually does, I thought. I don't like it. It just seems super, like, fake. She seemed to take her time a bit. It was a recorded segment and not a live promo, so I think she sounded a little better than usual. I still don't think she's good, but... Um, and I'm not super hyped for that match either, right? Uh, but anyways, we'll see. We then get Which good old... Which has already happened as of this That's recording. because yes, it has. Uh, Briggs and Jensen are taken on Legato. And Briggs and Jensen control the early portion of this as commentary. Ignore it, right? Because they're busy talking about Jensen's romantic issues. So why would they bother <laughs> calling the match in front of them? Briggs and Jensen... What, what match? Isolate Mendoza, hit their tandem sliding punch thing that is just awful. Like, such a build. They both, like, run hit the rope, slide out of the ring, and then punch their opponent. It's uh-huh. really, really that lame. sounds I'm effective. not a fan. Wild hits a splash to the floor after holding himself horizontally on the ring post that looks pretty cool. Uh, Legato isolate Jensen, hit their repeated corner attack thing that I'm not a big fan of before hitting him with a double suplex. Briggs gets a nice hot tag, um, ending in a double underhook backbreaker to Wild. Lopez, of course, gets up on the apron, distracts Briggs. Mendoza hits a missile drop kick to stop Briggs. Fallon Henley comes down, tackles Lopez on the floor to stop her. This distracts Wild as he's up on the top rope. He goes for a 450 to Briggs, but Briggs catches Wild by the throat, picks him up and choke slams him. Jensen comes back in conveniently, and they hit their high low finisher to Joaquin Wild. And Jensen and Briggs pick up the win in about five and a half minutes. Totally fine TV tag team match uh, with multiple distractions, of course, because people don't win clean anymore because this is now main roster light where it's even Steven booking and people have to can't lose clean any ever. So um, they, I actually thought they did a pretty good job of making Briggs look like a monster more than they have in the past here. He had a super hot tag. Um, where he looked like a beast, and then he kind of caught Wild by the throat on that 450, like reminiscent of something like Kane or Undertaker would do, you know what I mean? Like catching him and then picking him up and choke slamming him. So I, no big man is complete without a choke slam. That's right. Uh, solid TV match, but again, lots of distractions. Um, it then sort of slides from here because we get Indy and Persia talking about current events backstage. I believe it was the, the slap heard around the world from the Oscars that I couldn't possibly care less about at this point. Uh, they start to bicker, and they literally make a match at Stand and Deliver because you all make your own matches on NXT, of course, as we've talked about at length. Unless you're but, this, Grimes. but the stakes at this match, you know what they're fighting for? Mm. Who is the hottest couple in NXT? Because that's what adults care about. Yep. So stupid. I care about that. Um, this is one of those segments that honestly makes me question watching this show. Who is this for? Who actually likes this? I want to know people who actually like this segment and this storyline. I don't think it's the performer's fault, but this is garbage. And I just, it makes me, like, why am I watching this? It's like, I, I don't, don't know. know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Mackenzie talks to Grimes about his last chance match tonight in the triple threat to try and get in the ladder match for the North American title. Um, Grimes is much more toned down and serious again. He's nervous. He puts over the other competitors in the match. And this is more about the championship, or sorry, uh, it's about honoring a promise to his father. Um, so it was fine. Grimes shows considerable range, right? Because he has played a lot of different characters in NXT, and he does a pretty good job with any of them. But don't you feel like if this is his story, like he's trying to fulfill a promise to his dead father, he kind of has to win, don't you think? Yeah. It kind of makes Wait, it feel like... this or the latter match? I don't know if they're trying to say both, but at least this. I feel like yeah. maybe it's both. So I don't know how you could have Grimes lose and like you have your baby face like dishonor his father or not fulfill a promise to his dead father. So it's kind of like they're booking him to have to win, it feels like, but who knows. Um, Toxic Attraction hit the ring. I almost sent you a link to this segment because, wow, um, it's (laughs) it's amazing. So Mandy starts talking. She starts out, I was confused, because it sounds like she wants to weasel out of facing multiple opponents, right? Because she's got to face 
Cora Jade, Io Shirai, and Kaylee Ray. she's legally obligated to face all of them but for her own. She starts to talk like she she doesn't want to face them, but then she just flips and talks about how tough she is and how her group... Um, about, talks tough about her and her group and how she'll beat all of the other three women and cement her legacy as the greatest NXT women's champion of all time. So quickly flips into like, nope, I'm willing to take on three people at a time, even though I'm a heel and it doesn't make sense. Um, Mandy sort of stumbles a little bit here, mentioning Jade and Gonzalez, then says stuff about Wendy Chu, and they dump out a bag of Wendy Chu's stuff. So I guess the idea is they're the ones that destroyed Wendy Chu's stuff, but also took some of it with them. I don't know. Cause they're, Souvenir. Because they're children. Um, Gigi Dolan gets the mic, and she is awful. She shrieks, uh, was my description, about Kai and Chu and how TA, uh, Toxic Attraction run the division. JC Jane takes over. She's not quite as bad as Dolan, but she's also really bad. She says there's no one left for them to face. Gee, I wonder where that could be going. They're going to stand and deliver just to watch Mandy beat the other three women because they don't have a match themselves. Hmm. Wonder what's going to well, happen. Since they're heels, why don't they book themselves in They match? should, right? Mandy says their catchphrase, I don't even remember what it is at this point, Dakota's, Dakota Kai's music hits. She comes out to defend Chu's honor, I guess, as these are the people that attacked the woman she hated three weeks ago but was best friends with last week, even though we have no idea why. Um, so, what does this say? The members defend Chu's honor, I guess. Members gave for Kai. <laughs> oh, you know what that is? Oh, my God. Numbers game. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Numbers game for Kai gets the better of her. So, guess what? Raquel Gonzalez music hits. She comes out, uh, faces end up standing tall, of course, because Gonzalez cleans house, blah, blah, blah. Well, Kai and Gonzalez big. look at each other with some tension, and then they hug, and like Kai just jumps onto Gonzalez and koala bears her, basically. <laughs> um, Dakota Kai picks up one of the tag team titles that Toxic Attraction left while making their hasty defeat, holds it up, and now it looks like Gonzalez and Dakota Kai will face toxic attraction for the titles that stand and deliver and that is later confirmed and probably has happened while we're talking they are it already happened yeah. i covered it in don't, the news don't spoil oh you did spoil it already that's right um <laughs> so honestly all three of toxic attraction were bad in their promos especially the tag team women rose was better but she wasn't good either but honestly dolan is awful jc jane is really bad uh and they sort of blew any chance of Kai and Gonzalez telling a story of them reuniting. They just skipped a whole bunch of steps and have them immediately back together on this show. So that kind of bugged me. Um, there's just everything moves too quickly. There's no real development of any stories or any characters unless it's like some sort of story for 11 year olds about couples and making out. Um, Dolan and Jane were truly tough to watch here. This segment took a really long time and felt like NXT were trying to like shoehorn one last match into the stand and deliver show like a couple days before it takes place basically um mckenzie then talks to carmelo hayes about the qualifying matches and without a hint of irony he talks about that he should basically be the gm because he booked all of those matches right and, right it's kind of funny because yeah everyone right. he booked like Four or three matches or four like matches. Like a last chance Whatever qualifier, which, right. they, which they always do. So, yeah, he is pretty much the de facto GM, I think, at this point. Grayson Waller interrupts Bragg. GM of the mid-card. One thing I like about Waller is he's still living off of jumping off of the cage in the... Um, was it the... What do you call those matches with the cage in NXT that I'm forgetting? War Games? There you go. You... Because <laughs> I'm old, man. I'm old. It's been a long week. So he interrupts and brings up um, he, that he and Mello have come a long way since he jumped, remember when I jumped off the cage? So he mentions that a lot, which I kind of find funny. Right. Um, obviously they think each of them will win, etc. It's your, it's your boy, Von Wagner is here. He's taken on Bodie Hayward. Um, and the attractive woman that we knew was a plant and not a fan. They tell us her name. Have you heard her name? No. Sophia Cromwell. <laughs> and that she's an associate of Stone, even though she never talks to Stone, interacts with Stone, or anything. But we're, they're just letting us know, because God forbid you actually tell a story with what people do, and you just have commentary. Just tell us, you know, just tell us what's going on. That's good storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, Bodhi gets in a couple of flurries. Wagner wins in less than four minutes with his 
I put fireman's carry slam thing, angle slam question mark, fireman's carry neck breaker question mark. Not sure because it's kind of not clean. It's kind of in between both of them. What, Von Wagner? Yeah, not clean. No. So for some reason, could Kushida and Jiro um, had their own commentary table for this match. Because Von Wagner is just so good. You got to see it in person. Wagner ends up attacking them, pulling Jiro into the ring, hitting his finisher on Jiro, and then ripping Jiro's jacket in two as Wade Barrett tells us. That's his entire identity. So they're basically like, yep, here in NXT, we're so damn lazy. This guy's character is man who wears loud sport jackets, right? Like he has no other character to him. And they're basically admitting it like that's his entire identity is wearing that flashy jacket. Super lame. Right. Um, so standard Von Wagner almost squash match. The involvement of jacket time didn't help. And Cromwell is there but doesn't interact with anyone. So I'm not really sure what's going on. But who cares? I, I don't like the last name. It's just not pleasant to hear. And you, you have the ability. You're literally making their names. Like do a better job right. on any of these. Make for, them memorable. Yeah. Like that's just. Like for me it was. So um, when um the rascals come in and you're like wesley and nat what is it nash Nash carter Carter. like just the most generic doesn't stand out at all to me anyways tony d'angelo vignette he says champa made a big mistake attacking him from behind tony knows what's best for the family and champa's last match will be at stand and deliver and then tony will control everything as the new dawn this is the same over the top cartoon gimmick that makes everyone involved feel like a joke including champa D'Angelo has had some good matches that I have liked, but his character work takes me out of anything because it's just over-the-top, stereotypical mobster nonsense. It's ridiculous, and I can't stand it. Speaking of can't stand it, Nikita Lyons is shadow boxing backstage ahead of her match tonight. But first, we're going to get Joe Gacy versus Draco Anthony. Um, Gacy goes for a handshake right away. Anthony slaps it away. Commentary, tell us tell us again they have sort of shown us i guess but they're filling in the gaps for us so the gym is draco anthony's safe space and that's where he goes to clear his head but he keeps being interrupted by gacy and how and harland every time he's working out um and they're trying to recruit him to their little cult i guess we get a ddt Why? at some point by gacy and then the huge guy that's been around that i used to see in championship wrestling from hollywood kind of the guy that looks like mabel similar size kind of thing He's shown in the crowd wearing a large shirt, and if you think that matters or we'll come back to that at all, you would be wrong because there's no further mention <laughs> of this guy at all. We get a twisting Uranagi slam by Gacy. He looks pretty good, and he is continuing to try and recruit uh, Anthony mid-match. You can hear him in his banter sort of trying to still get Anthony to join them. Anthony gets a flurry, including a back elbow and a suplex. Bit of sloppiness then by Anthony before Gacy hits his handspring clothesline for the win in four minutes. I don't understand how that's a finisher. So, no, it's, it's just, wow, you, put a, you could do a handspring, rather chubby guy, but it's still just a clothesline. Exactly. At the end I of mean, the that's NXT 2. Although the finishers. buckshot, I guess, too. But yeah, the buckshot's cool. Kinda, it kind of looks like he picks up momentum, too. Right? You yeah. could at least argue that. In Whereas the buckshot the, or the handspring? The buckshot. Yeah. The handspring, I don't feel like it does so much. But well, I feel like it's because, like, it's like... You're like, I guess he's like kind of rebounding on his throws, but I feel like he's like going in the direction to like be like, oh, going back yeah. this way. Like, I feel like Buckshot's at least like he's going like, he's like flipping to like, and then yes. he usually nails them pretty good too. He does. It comes down to a sell a lot of the time. That is also the case. Uh, so it's tough to accomplish much in a four minute match like this. And honestly, Draco Anthony has not stood out to me in any way at all since being in NXT. But again, he's in like three minute matches. So it's really hard to say much. Standard NXT match at a match at this point, right? Where it's like, under four minutes, one guy gets like maybe a flurry or two and the other guy wins. It's pretty much feels like what we're getting here. Um, I was expecting something after the match, like more recruitment stuff or something involving the trainee that they showed at ringside, but there was nothing. The match ended and they moved on. So it felt really, really strange. Um, pretty long Braun Breaker vignette ahead of Stand and Deliver. Really quickly, I'll summarize. Biggest match of Braun's life. He'll be the guy, etc. Ziggler is a poison. He shows up and takes things, then leaves while giving nothing back. NXT is Braun's life. He trains really hard, harder than everybody else, etc. He will take back the brand for everyone that chants NXT. So again, a really lengthy vignette, but I thought Breaker did a good job. He actually sounded quite a bit better in this recorded segment than he does in live promos. He was a little more subdued. I find when he tries to get super intense, he sounds a little silly. Uh, Very, very much a Steiner for sure. 
but I preferred him in this like subdued uh, pre-recorded thing instead. So here comes Nikita Lyons. She's taken on Sloane Jacobs. Never heard of her. Doesn't matter. Commentary rave about Lyons on social media and that everybody loves her pictures and stuff. Who cares? Oh my God. Social Me? media. I care. Yeah. Um, this felt like a training match because it was like shoulder tackle, shoulder tackle, clothesline, arm drag, arm drag. Then we get a spinning back kick by Lyons. Sloan briefly works Lyons' left arm, but Lyons hits a German suplex, a Samoan drop, and some more kicks. And then she does her finisher, question mark, which is doing the splits onto her opponent and pinning them while holding the splits. I thought like the first time it was at least after a move, right? It's like, bad. It's, yeah, it's... It looks really bad. And the fact that you get pinned by someone's leg across you, that's it. I'm not a huge fan. Yeah. Um, it's not even like it's Nia Jax. No. I thought her finisher looks bad, and what can I really say about a two-minute match? After the match, Last Legend appears on the Tron. Hooray! And says she has unfinished business with Lions. Hooray! And that she's a bigger superstar than Lions, etc., etc. So I guess we're going to get that match, which should be awful again. But anyways. Malcolm Bivens is with Diamond Mine, cutting the promo of the night here easily. He says that everyone's afraid to fight Diamond Mine alone. Says Roddy will win tonight, climb the ladder at Stand and Deliver, and win the North American title. And then the Creeds will win the tag team titles. After that, Diamond Mine will have more gold than Mr. T himself. No mention of Ivy Nile getting gold, I noticed. Wait, why Mr. T? Because he wore a million gold chains all. Yeah, that was kind of his gimmick. How is that timely at all? It's not. Or like, what is that? Like, is he... It's WrestleMania season, I guess, would and be the he argument. The first WrestleMania. There you first go. First two? You talked it out yourself. Okay. Answered your own question. So by that, like, insanely <laughs> not good logic, that is a good reference. Yeah, amazing. Uh, Diamond Mine starts to leave. Brutus gets a text from, I forget what the area code is, a number he doesn't recognize. And the text says that they'll be watching Stand and Deliver. So, of course, the Creeds assume it's whoever attacked them in the parking lot so many weeks ago. Or it's um, another team. <laughs> Bivens is always good, so I thought he was fine. And I guess maybe it looks like the mystery attacker will be revealed at Stand and Deliver. So that's fine as well. I'd be cool if it was somebody new. I don't know if it will be. The Creed still don't sound great in promos, but I do think they are improving. They've got a bright future. Oh, other than, sorry, that's not true, because they're a tag team. So they will be garbage. Um, Brutus will do nothing. Julius will split off into a singles person, I would imagine. Yeah, um, you got to have a Marty Jannetty. You do. Then we get the main event, which is the last chance match for a spot in the ladder match at Stand and Deliver for the North American title. It's Roderick Strong taking on A-Kid, taking on Cameron Grimes. So... All three start out grappling and jockeying for position. It was kind of interesting because they're all like standing switch and grabbing this, but escaping and countering all three of them, um, leading to a, eventually a stalemate. Grimes then hits a monkey flip to A-Kid, but it goes right into, uh, he flips A-Kid into a Hurricane Rana on Roderick Strong. It was kind of cool. Uh, Carmelo Hayes shows up and joins commentary. Get a diving forearm to Strong on the floor by A-Kid. Grimes punts A-Kid from the apron, but then Strong shows up, hits a back suplex to Grimes on the apron. We get a strong superplex to Grimes and an immediate frog splash to Grimes by A-Kid from the opposite corner. Escobar and Sokoa are out to watch, and Waller comes out too, so all the competitors are there checking this out. Strong power bombs A-Kid onto Grimes, tries to put both of them in a stronghold simultaneously, but can't. Grimes hits a Hurricane Rana to both men at the same time, and then runs around hitting forearms and kicks before a high cross off the top to um, A-Kid. Crossbody moonsault slam by Grimes to Strong. Wasn't as clean as it has been at some point. Then a huge swinging DDT by A-Kid to Grimes. Strong with backbreakers to A-Kid before a high knee and the end of heartache. Grimes appears out of nowhere, though, to hit the cave-in to Strong for the win oh, after the 11 minutes. Um, I thought this was a good match, easily the match of the night. What I thought was really unique about this was so this was a triple threat where all three men were involved the entire time. So no, you know how it's always like someone gets taken right. out to the floor? Right. There was none of that. Like these three guys worked the entire time together, which I thought was a cool decision to make. It made it seem really fast paced because there was always something going on. Each man got a chance to hit some cool offense and a bunch of flurries. So I thought this was an enjoyable match and, and different from most triple threat matches you get in most companies, if I'm being honest. Uh, after the match... Carmelo Hayes takes the mic, says that there's no way Grimes will win at Stand and Deliver. Then everyone involved in the match obviously gets to say one little thing before they all start brawling to end the show. So 
it seems like they're putting a lot into this North American title match, which I think will probably be the best match on that show. It should kind of has to be. Uh, um, so it seems like that's what they're hyping the most here to end. So overall, an underwhelming go home show. I think the opener and the main event were pretty good, which which means I can at least pass this show, which is nice. But everything in between was just sort of there. You had your standard short NXT matches, a really awful, I thought, and fairly lengthy toxic attraction segment, uh, juvenile crap from Persia and Indy again. Um, so I thought this was a C minus show. It's still a chore to get through every week. It's one of those openers good. Main event's good, everything in between, not so much. So a C- minus from me, which is a pretty standard grade for NXT 2.0 at this point. All right, fella, you want to talk about some WrestleMania quickly? Not even a little bit, but here we go. And so I'm pretty much going off the top of my head for this one because this is easily, by far, the least interested I've ever been in a WrestleMania. So you'll be getting my thoughts on... Stuff I really don't care about, but we're going to talk about. Make predictions, too. Right? Yeah, Are you I'm recording these? Yeah, I'm too. So, yes, right. I am. So, let's tell me. What's, so we'll uh, do you night, have it by day? We'll go night one. All right. Yep. So, night one, hit me. Tonight, uh, McIntyre, yes. Corbin. Oh, I'll take Drew McIntyre. Because he is just, I think, a bigger star. And again, I don't watch main roster, so I'm not sure. No, I think it's But I feel like he's positioned still as a, a just like a notch below main eventer and a Corbin I don't think is, so I'll take Drew McIntyre. Uh Kingston and Woods versus Seamus and Ridge Holland accompanied by Pete Dunn. Sorry, who are you picking? Did you take McIntyre? Yeah. I didn't hear oh, you. Oh right, sorry, I forgot to say. You yes. Take, okay. Uh sorry, say that again. Kingston Woods, Seamus Holland. Kingston Woods, Seamus Holland. Tag match. I will say I'll take the heels just cause. Because I feel like they might want to push them. I don't know. I'll take me there because I don't yeah. really care. I don't either. And it, I'm probably wrong, but I'm going to try and say they're going to try and reward Holland for breaking Biggie's neck or something. Or because Pete Dunn's there, even though he's not in the match. I'm sorry, who? Pete Dunn. I'm sorry, who? Pete Dunn. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see you saying Gunther. Yeah. No. So maybe they'll give Ridge Holland the win to like make him feel better for snapping Biggie's neck is what I mean. Not reward him, but... <laughs> Make like to be better. like it's okay, buddy. We still like you and have plans for you. Uh, Usos versus Nakamura and Boogs SmackDown tag titles. Who has the titles? Usos. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna take Usos. You're taking Usos. He'll keep the belts, and Roman will keep his belt. That makes sense. I'll take Usos as well because I don't. Do Shinsuke and Boogs function as a tag team regularly now? I guess because Nakamura is not gonna do anything. Right. And I don't think they're going to put the belt on Nakamura, so I'll say the Usos retain as well. Mm. Uh, Miz and Logan Paul versus the Mysterious. Oh my god, we have to watch that? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pick Paul, because I think there's a chance to get like a lot of heat off of that. So you're taking Miz and Logan Paul? I will take the Mysterios, because I feel like they're going to start to push Dominic soon, unfortunately, even though I can't stand him, but... That is a match I really don't care And then about. maybe like they split up after. Could okay, be. so Rollins versus Mystery. So first I'm going to go with who you think is going to appear uh, and then who you think will win the match. It's so. Cody Rhodes and Cody Rhodes wins because he has to win his first match. So I feel like I told you the most recent thing I read was like people close to Cody are saying he's not committed or not for sure. But I think that's exactly what they would say if he was coming, right? Right. Like what are they going to say? Yep, he's definitely showing up. Yeah, I'm going to pick Cody, too. I saw, like, Bray Wyatt's teasing, like, but I don't think... Or, like, Shane McMahon is their yeah. safety valve. I would love if if it was Bray. I would actually prefer that, but I, um, I definitely think it's Cody. I don't need to see Bray Wyatt anymore. I'm kind of nice. over him. Nah, Bray Wyatt's the best. Uh, um, Belair Lynch, Raw Women's Title. Oh, that's tough. I'm going to... I'll take Lynch. I just I'll think... take Belair because it's different, and I feel like that could go either way. I think um, they still just want to keep Lynch as the headliner, but I could be wrong. I feel like Lynch has kind of gone long enough. I feel like she's kind she of has, stale. She has. That's for sure. Uh, Rousey Flair. I'm going to take Rousey because Rousey's back. I'll take Flair because that's my rule. Pick Charlotte Flair on paper. Okay, and then just for fun, what do you think will happen in the Steve Austin segment? Uh, they will brawl, and Owens will take a stunner, obviously. I think. I don't know. And maybe get hit with plunder, probably. Because I don't know what uh, what Austin can actually do. So what are you saying? Um, I think that's fair. I'd say like, I'd say like you get like a decent segment, and then like maybe like 
Owens, like, I would say, like, Owens attacks and, like, they have a brawl and then, like, Austin stands uh, tall. And I love Kevin Owens. I just don't care about Stone Cold Steve Austin at this point. Like, the pop's going to be insane. The crowd's going to go nuts for him. Probably the biggest pop of the weekend, but, like, for a segment and a stunner is what we're going to get. I'm pretty sure. Don't yep. care. Um. Okay, night two. Mm-hmm. Women's tag titles four away. Baszler, Natalia. Uh uh, Ripley, Morgan, Banks, Naomi, Vega, Carmella. Wow. I don't care, so I'm going to pick Baszler. So you're taking Baszler and Natalia. Sorry, who else is there? I... Maria Ripley, Liv Morgan, Sasha Banks, Naomi, Zelina, Vega, Carmella. Are any of these teams teams? Not really. I'll say I'm just literally picking someone at random. Cause... I did that too. I just like Baszler. So I'll I'm take pick Banks Baszler. and Naomi. They're one of the teams? They <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were gonna challenge, and what then and then disaster. Ripley and Morgan got it. Okay, uh, the no DQ match, Knoxville's Sami Zayn. Oh my God! Please, Sami Zayn wins. I guess I'm gonna take Zayn too. Yeah, because we better not have a non wrestler beat a 20 year veteran or whatever. But man, this WrestleMania sounds awful. Um, RK Bro versus Alpha Academy versus Street Profits Raw Tag Titles. That match could actually be good. Yeah, I seen like. Um, I don't know, I could see Arkibro winning, but I'm going to pick Alpha Academy to take the titles back, because then you do the Arkibro split, which they should have done already. Right. So I'll take Alpha Academy. So I will take Street Profits. They're going to get a run, and then they're eventually... I think they're the least likely. And then they're eventually going to push Montez Ford as a single star. Um, the Someone who they've now labeled as a babyface, Bobby Lashley versus Omos. Omos wins. Uh, and, and Lashley gets some spot where he picks him up and does something to yeah, him. Yeah, I'll take Omos, too. And that'll be his. Uh, McAfee, Austin Theory, I'm taking McAfee. Oh, my God. It's um, obvious. Yeah, I think I have to take McAfee, I guess. I don't... What a terrible card this is. They... Man, I'm glad we have the network. Well, not glad, but I would not pay for this. Right. Uh, Edge, AJ Styles. Mm. New Edge. I will take Edge because uh, Edge seems to be I'll, doing a lot more than AJ right now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'll take it Edge too. And if he's if he's for some like major faction to start, right? Like you probably I don't know. Maybe that's him. a factor. I guess he maybe he loses and whatever. I'll still take Edge. Maybe Priest helps him tonight. Get a third tomorrow. Could be yeah. Not tonight. I mean tomorrow, tomorrow night. and then Monday. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. Lesnar Reigns taking Reigns. Yep. Roman Reigns because Roman, Roman Reigns. Reigns. At this point, yes. It feels I'll like that's where they're see why Lesnar needs to be champion. Uh, I don't think he should beat Roman. I don't know what the end game is, but it's not. Well, Lesnar. and if we then are going to, we have one champion that has to work both shows that I feel like Roman Reigns. That's not Reigns. Lesnar. Roman Reigns, exactly. Roman Reigns is much more likely to be like, yes, I will do that. And Brock is much more likely to be like, nope, I'm not doing that. So, yeah, I think it's Reigns. Yep, uh, that is it. Wow. All right, well, that is a very, very lackluster card. Very disappointing. It's supposed to be the biggest wrestling show of the year for any company, and it looks like trash pretty much to it me. It does. But anyways, I digress. All right, we'll transition into our final segment each week where Jack apparently has a pretty beefy update from the world of wrestling action figures, and that is figuring it out with Jack. So they did a lot of reveals for WrestleMania 38 access, so Makes that's sense. cool. I'll go from top to bottom because that's easy. It's mostly the renders, then you get into like some of the proto figures. Um, so uh, unmatched series four from AEW is up for pre-order. That's not important. TNT toy belt <laughs> uh, up for pre-order ringside. It's the debut version, so it's the crappy version of the belt. So that's a cool. Um, there's a they revealed a ringside exclusive elite Cameron Cameron Grimes. What's available to the moon Cameron Grimes. Nice. He's got money, wads of money, and still hold him. He's got the hat, the vest, a uh, million dollar title, so it looks pretty good. Uh, they, there is the actual figure later. Um, and the head skin's okay. It's like a open mouth expression. Like it kind of looks like him. It just looks kind of iffy. Right. Um. So we have Elite ninety five Biggie, which I think is from when the day he cashed in the briefcase. It looks like. So that's. So that's cool. It comes with the W title. I don't know if there's anything else yet, but so I think that's from when he cashed in mm-hmm. on Lashley. So that's cool. Elite ninety five Shotzi. Um, your favorite looks like Shotzi. So uh, amazing. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, so then there's Bobby La- Elite 95 Bobby Lashley also comes to W titles the black tights with white logos um, I wish it was like the white tights or the red tights it would have been more interesting so this just looks like a almost a repeat of his last Elite just slightly different color so it's a slight repaint Right. Um, Elite 95 John Cena's reveal I think it's from when you returned that money in the bank and interrupted Roman so that's alright the Elite 95 G so we saw a few weeks back um, it's just like a or it's a Jimmy Uso, but they use a Jay Uso head and give him red hair. It's just it does not look like Jimmy. It literally looks like Jay, and I I can tell the difference. I cannot. Like, um, but I believe you. There's Elite ninety five Eddie Guerrero, so it's it's like a ruthless aggression. Eddie Guerrero comes with the SmackDown tag title of that era. Mm-hmm. I think one of them is kind of like a Los Guerreros Eddie Guerrero. One of them's green tights, one of them's black tights because he also has the Chase variant. So it looks pretty cool. The the face skin's not the best, but I I think it's pretty cool. Um, nice. I like the Legends Elite better that I got. They Showed uh, new images for the Wolfpack Hogan ringside exclusive Boo. elite, so that's okay. Um, no one buy that. That's there. Um, then there's the SummerSlam 2022 elite figure. So we have Shawn Michaels from 2005. Eh, eh, eh. Why? Eh. What? Hogan match. Eh, oh, eh. oh, the oversell. Yep. Nice. And then you have Rey Mysterio from the Custody of Dominic ladder match. Awesome. Um, you have Randy Orton in the cream skull orange trunks from when he won the World Heavyweight title, so that's kind of cool. And then a uh, sensational sharing like this white gear. And so, given that there's a summer, it's a summer thing. You want to guess what the SummerSlam themed uh, build a figure is? I have no idea. It is related to one of the figures. I have still have no idea. Diesel. Child Dominic. Oh boy, <laughs> that's weird. From the custody of the Mallard match. That's weird. And you you get a briefcase with that figure with the Rey Mysterio too, so you could put him in it. You just <laughs> <laughs> no, you could you could do the ladder match, and I think the Eddie Guerrero I have is from that around that time. So nice. Then they showed a uh, proto for um the a Survivor Series Elite Becky Lynch. It's from the your favorite pay per view last year, which was Survivor Series. Yeah, that it's was... like the Wanda looking gear. Right. Um, there's Elite Top show. Talent John Cena, which might be a re-release of Elite Series Three or something. So that's kind of cool. Um, it's blue. <laughs> um, then there's a uh, Top Talent Randy Orton, which is like got like yellow decals on it, uh, black tights. It's a pretty standard Randy Orton, but it's alright. Um, Elite Top Talent 2023 Drew McIntyre, which it just looks like a re-release of his last Elite. And then um, there's Ray Myst- uh, Ray Mysterio from the Top Talent Elite, which I think is from uh. WrestleMania Backlash last year. Mm, so. Another great pay per view. <laughs> um, then we have Ultimate Edition. I want to say Ultimate Edition fourteen or fifteen. I think Ultimate Edition fifteen it might be. There's Roman Reigns. Um, it's Red Gauntlet Roman Reigns. I think they actually sculpted a bit on the fist, which is kind of cool. Nice. Um, it comes with a Bloodline shirt, Universal title, the red like lay yes. necklace, yep. so whatever they call it. Um, the same lo- hair down and man bun sculpts we saw from the last elites, and then uh, like a ah. From the Aua, <laughs> you know, like one of those. His taunt, yeah. Yeah, that gotcha. kind of thing. It looks kind of weird. <laughs> um, then yeah, there's also Ultimate Edition uh, NWO Savage. Nice. So that's kind of cool. Yep. Macho Madness stuff. Yeah. Um, then <laughs> there's Ultimate Edition Goldberg. And it's a WCW Goldberg. So it's like, it comes with the World Heavyweight title and the WCW US title. And then like two heads we've already seen in black trunks so it's like basically an ultimate edition of an elite i already have right um and then there's a new head sculpt which is him blowing smoke out of his mouth with the smoke which i'm pretty sure it came out of his nose right when, in entrance well during his entrance yeah i think both maybe i don't know I don't, it just looks funny um there's showdown two pack series nine there's rock and cena from mania 29 ricochet and sheamus from when ricochet wore street clothes like a dumb idiot and then uh Bailey and Sasha Banks from Hell in a Cell 2020. Nice. So that's something. That is something. Uh, Legends uh, Elite, I think. I don't know what number this is. I want to say it's like 16 or 17. There's Molly Holly. There's a, the normal one, and there's also Mighty Molly. Mighty Molly. One of them's a chase. Um, then there's Rey Mysterio from Legends. I think it's from uh, Last Stand. Or, sorry, not Last Stand. Uh, one Night Stand 2006, because he's wearing like the long tights. So mm-hmm. it was probably like a... And it comes with the World Heavy title, so that makes me think it was when he was champion. I think it's from uh, One Night Stand when he faced, I think it was Sabu. And then you, there's also the Acolytes in that series, so that's kind of cool. Nice. And then there's Russo's Aggression Elite Series 2. Uh, there's an NWO Booker T when he was in the WWE NWO. Oh, I was going to say, what? Yeah. yeah that um, there's sense. this white, long pants ring Mysterio, and then a black and green RVD with the oval IC title, so that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. There's a lot of Rey Mysterios to say for some reason. Then there's Top Talents Basics. They're all not new, so I don't care about those. 
Uh, there's a new Reckon playset. It's a Reckon rig. It has stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah. Then there's some pre-orders from Elite 94, Basic 132, Summer Slam Elites, Elite Top Talent, Basic Top Talent. Um, yeah. And then there's like now images for stuff like just showing figures we've already seen just now, like in the flesh. Some of the figures I already talked about mostly, um, like the Roots Aggression Elites and other it's um they showed um msk elite 94 so nice the in the black green and white so that's cool these are the ring gears i like so these are pretty nice then there's showdown two pack series i want to say series 10 there's hogan and andre mm-hmm. lashley and miz omos and aj then there's some basics there's austin 316 with the paint on 316 day shirt a uh, blue tights or blue trunks balor long tights alexander one of them's black and gold her business one of them's like a a red and yellow and there's like a basic Roman Reigns, which I think might be a new head sculpt. Italian Tamina. There's two Taminas. That sucks. Uh, and Sorry, did you say Natalian Tamina? Yeah. Because it got, sounded like you said Italian Tamina. Huh. Like, what would that figure look like? <laughs> and there's Riddle. Um, there's Chunks Kushida. A really old, like, WCW, maybe even ECW Mysterio basic. Then they just have basics that we are, we've already seen. Um, cool. That's it. That's it? Yeah. Well, that is going to bring us to the end of episode 89. We actually did better than I thought time-wise. We're at 2.15 right now. That's not bad for us. Um, so, are we? have we discussed what are we going to be talking about? Are we going to review Mania? Yeah, I mean, we can try to. Okay, and it might just be us complaining for a long time about it, but that's sometimes fun to listen to. I'm going to check out Stand and Deliver. I don't know if I'll do a solo mission or not. I may just, when we're talking about other things, mention what I liked or didn't like from it. I'm also planning on watching Supercard of Honor, I think, but I don't know if I'll get around to talking about that. But you can definitely expect some sort of episode where we're going to talk about WrestleMania, it looks like. And then we will absolutely be back for episode 90 next Saturday. So thanks for joining us. Any time you spend listening to us talk about wrestling is really appreciated. We'd love to hear any feedback, fnswrestling at gmail.com or on Instagram at fns underscore wrestling underscore podcast. Or if you're one of the couple dozen people that listen to us on YouTube, feel free to put a comment there. I will definitely get back to you. But thanks again for listening. We'll see you back here next Saturday for sure, if not before. And until then, take care.